Good afternoon. We are going to begin this afternoon's agenda with a proclamation recognizing Minority Mental Health Month, and that will be presented by Council Members Jawando, Albernaz, and Sales. Right. If you're here for the Minority Mental Health Proclamation, come on down. We're joined by our DHHS Summer Rise interns, too. Special shout out. And uh, my colleagues, Council Members Albernaz, who chairs our Health and Human Services, and Council Member Sales, who is the lead. Uh, for our disparities in public health for the council. Um, we've got uh, Dr. Bridgers, uh, Dr. Davis, I mentioned our Summer Rise interns for DHHS, uh, George McFarland, I saw Wanda Smith from the African American Health Program, uh, Sammy uh, Subkota, did I say, where's Sammy? Yeah, there you are. From the uh, Asian American Health Initiative, Monica Weinberg, uh and others from Identity. There you are. Hello. And Dr. Sonia uh, Bruton, who I saw from CCI. Or, hey, Sonia. Good to see you. And uh, in team, and Missouri, and from our wonderful partners at Every Mind. They're, I know I saw them. Uh, and we've got Our Minds Matter, the Trevor Project, NAMI, Montgomery County, CCACC, Mental Health Services, the Muslim Community Center, um, and so many others. Thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, on this important issue. Uh, we knew this before, but um, the isolation um, and uh, the triple, at least triple pandemic for people of color uh, over the last three years between the health, the economic fallout, and obviously the social justice uh, moment that we've had and are still having have caused a lot of stress on already uh, communities that have been stressed and pushed to the max dealing with income inequality dealing with uh, health outcomes that aren't, that are persistent and disparities that are persistent. Uh, we just talked about one of the many ways uh, that it, it's difficult in our society to live a full and healthy life uh, as we were talking about pedestrian access in communities and development in communities. So it's now, it's more important, it's always been important, uh, but it's really important now more than ever to recognize the work that's being done uh, on minority health, mental health in particular. Uh, and I'm just honored to stand here with my colleagues to lift up the work. We are fortunate in Montgomery County to have some great organizations doing great work that's grown over the last several years, but we still have a lot to do. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of stress and there's still a lot of stigma associated with mental health. Um, and I'll put myself in that category. You know, I've, there's been times in my life where I have resisted uh, the demonstrated need to seek mental health assistance. Um, and we need to destigmatize that and continue to do it. And that's one of the many goals of Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. So I'm going to turn it over to my, my colleagues, but you have our, all of our commitment, collective commitment, to make sure we're supporting these organizations, supporting the work. And if you need help, please get help. Uh, we have so many great organizations here. I'm so thankful that you all took time in the middle of the day to come out and talk about the important work that's happening. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Councilmember Arbanaz and then Councilmember Sales. Thank you so much, Councilmember Jawando. It's an honor and privilege to be here with all of you this afternoon. And you said it well. Um, we have to make sure that we take care of ourselves in addition to our loved ones. And the mental health disparities that exist throughout our entire public health infrastructure have never been so impactful as they have been these last few years. Coming out of a global pandemic, there are a lot of lessons learned, but there's also a lot of hope and optimism. For one, we are all working collectively to eliminate the stigma often associated with accessing mental health support. That is particularly true in our black and brown community, where for too many of our families, asking for help is seen as a weakness. And it is not, it is a strength. Particularly during these difficult times when we have global unrest, another 
very challenging presidential election cycle that will be looming. There are many factors out of our control. But what is in our control is the opportunity to access some of the great services and organizations, many of which are represented here. But all of us have a critical role to play, regardless of where we are in life, whether it's asking a neighbor how they're doing and being able to provide access to support and help, whether as policymakers, it's enacting policy and making sure we're supporting organizations financially that are on the front lines doing this work. Each of us has a role to play. So thank you very much, Councilmember Jawando, for bringing us together today. And I'm honored to now introduce my colleague on the Health and Human Services Committee who is addressing public health disparities head on, Councilmember Sales. Good afternoon, and thank you to my two colleagues for including me in this very important recognition. Um, I want to thank Councilmember Jawando for taking the time to recognize Minority Health Month and all of the great organizations and representatives that are um, here with us today. Um, as we've heard during the pandemic, mental health challenges and um, they were exacerbated, but a lot of resources were expended. Um, and the thing about mental health, while um, it knows no color, we are um, aware of the disparities that exist in communities of color with accessing mental health um, services and the systemic barriers that are associated with mental health uh, challenges. Um, and so, um, you know, it's important that we recognize the resources that are available to address the critical declines of mental health rates. Um, at the national level, I would like to highlight some great work. Um, one year ago, the Biden administration launched 988, a nationwide network of crisis centers to answer calls and text messages from folks who need rapid response to a mental health crisis. Since then, the United States hotline has fielded almost 5 million calls, texts, and chats supporting people in mental health crises. In May of this year, during Minority Health Month, the Pursuing Equity and Mental Health Act was reintroduced in the 118th Congress. This act would authorize $995 million in grants and other funding to support research to improve the pipeline of culturally competent providers, build on outreach programs that reduce stigma, and develop a training program for providers to manage disparities more effectively. At the county level, we have our work cut out, but we also have excellent service providers to combat the mental health crises, which include our 24-hour crisis prevention hotline, our centers, um, our mobile crisis team, our health and wellness centers at our schools, and soon we will have a health and wellness center at every MCPS school in Montgomery County. Um, and so I'm really excited to be here to um, recognize the council's um, continued efforts to lead on eliminating health disparities in our county um, and keenly aware of the importance of reducing stigma to ensure that more wraparound services are readily accessible to our minority communities. We are so fortunate to live in a county that prioritizes the disparities, um, that prioritize addressing the disparities that plague our diverse communities, and look forward to the rest of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Sales and Council Member Um So everyone here could speak, but we can't allow everyone to speak, but you're all here in support. So I'm gonna have representatives from our three minority health initiatives give a one minute or so uh, comment. Sammy, do you want to start? Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sammy Sapkura. I'm the BRL coordinator with Asian American Health Initiative, known as AAHI. Um, first and foremost, um, uh, let me express my heartfelt gratitude to council members uh, Joando, Sales, and Aldernos for extending this invitation um, for us to join uh, to celebrate this um, 
um, Minority uh, Mental Health Month. Um, I'll try to make it two minutes if that's okay. Um, I prefer. So um, as someone deeply passionate about addressing the mental and behavioral health needs of the Asian American population and the minority community, um, it fills me with immense pleasure to witness the Montgomery County Council recognizing and acknowledging the importance of dedicating a month to minority mental health and recognizing the need of the growing population in the county. Um, Montgomery County has much to celebrate when it uh, comes to mental and behavioral health uh, service delivery. Uh, we have robust and uh, comprehensive services to meet the needs of our community. While there's much to celebrate, this month is also an opportunity to reflect on what more is needed and recognize the work that needs to be done when addressing the mental health needs of the underrepresented population. So AHI in partnership and collaboration with the other minority health initiative and programs, namely the Latino Health Initiative and African Health Programs, um, launched the report that is very close to my heart, the Minority Voices 2022, Our Mental Health Journey. Through this report, it became clear that long-standing stigma and stereotypes continue to cause hesitancy in openly sharing mental health struggles within communities of colors and undeserved, um, uh, underserved communities. So HI, AHP, and LHI kicked off this project last year for Minority Mental Health Month um, and began collecting stories of mental health from our communities. We ultimately collected 27 stories, which we compiled into a report um, and through the analysis of the stories submitted by the community members, some themes emerged. Stigma, fear of being judged, and the lack of discussion about mental health were some of the main barriers to seeking mental health in the black and African American community. We found that cultural expected behavior to stay, sil to stay silent and the expectation to have a perfect mental health were the main barriers to seeking mental health support in the Asian American community. And as heartbreaking as it is, we continue to witness high rates of suicide and bullying among Asian American teens in Montgomery County, reflecting a deep-seated problem that requires urgent attention. In the Hispanic and Latino community, stigma and the fear of being labeled as crazy or judge prevent many from seeking the help they desperately need. This report has amplified the voices of Asian American, Black African American, Hispanic, and Latino communities shedding light on their mental health experiences and journey. It has also shown us that unconditional love, a non-judgmental support system, culturally responsive providers, language support, contributing back to the community, and access to the culturally and multilingual services, to name few, uh, were factors that positively impacted mental health and well-being. Furthermore, the report goes beyond just shedding light on the mental health experiences of our diverse communities. It also presents a comp compelling call to action that emphasizes the need for comprehensive whole of society effort to support the mental health needs of our community. These stories have deeply touched our hearts and underscore the urgency for change. I urge everyone to read, read, read this report and heed the voices of these 27 community members. Their stories are not just accounts of personal challenges, but reflections of the broader issues affecting minority mental health. By listening to their voices, we can develop a deeper understanding of the unique challenges they, they face, face together and work together to find comprehensive solutions. In the spirit of National Minority Mental Health Month, let's remember that our cultural diversity is our strength, and by recognizing it's significant in shaping our mental health experiences, we pave the way for a healthier and more compassionate future for ourselves and generations to come. Um, also want to give shout out to the Summarize Program students for that. Um, in, in closing, I want to express my deepest gratitude once again to council members, uh, Joando, Sales, and Arbanaz for recognizing Minority Mental Health Month. Thank you so much, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It was all very good. All right. And then very quickly, uh, Ms. Wanda Smith, because she said so much about the three initiatives already. <laughs> African American Health Program. Yes, very quickly, I want to him with the African American Health Community. And our goal is to address the health disparities in the African American community. And we want to see the community healthy. And uh, I go out every week and do screenings in the community. Uh, we do physical screenings and, of course, mental health screenings. And just as we have individuals who are in the community with high blood pressure and 
uh, diabetes and high cholesterol and other health issues, we have individuals who are walking around with anxiety and depression and PTSD and addictions. And these are individuals that are not getting treatment. And so it is an ongoing discussion to have individuals go get treatment, to understand what mental health is, and to address the stigma because there is a very high stigma in the African-American community. People don't want to talk about it. People don't want to think about it. But at the African-American Health Program, we have programs to put in place so we can have the dialogue about mental health. And as I said, it is an ongoing discussion because your mental health affects your physical health. And my model is your mental health is your physical health and your physical health is your mental health. So we encourage the community to take care of their health in, in general because we want a healthy community. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you, Wanda. And I, uh, Monica, or who's here from Latino? There we go. Come, come on up. Yes. I didn't have anything prepared, but I am going to say that I want to thank um, our partners at um, the Asian American Health Initiative for stating all the great findings that we, we had during the development of the report. But I also do want to um, highlight our partners from Identity, who we've been working so closely with to bring all of the resources that our Latino community needs to be able to provide linguistically and culturally competent or mindful resources for mental health and we will continue to do that for our entire latino community so thank you so much thank you all right we're gonna uh read this proclamation i want to you have you want to share here we go oh okay that's okay we're, we had a little uh so some of you have the world listening day proclamation that council member sales is going to do next so please give that back to her before you before you um <laughs> We're, but uh, and I have the ones for the health health day. Okay. All right. Um, we see we're, we're practicing right now. Mental health. Listening. All right. I'm going to start, and then Councilmember uh, Alvarez and Sales will join. You're going first, actually. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. And the proclamation declares National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month has been observed in July for 15 years to bring awareness to the specific and unique barriers to mental health faced by racial and ethnic minorities in the United States. Commemorating the work of author and activist B.B. Moore Campbell, this month has been recognized since former Maryland Congressman Representative Albert Wynn introduced the effort in 2008 and... Whereas mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being at all ages, racial and ethnic minorities in the United States experience both additional challenges to their mental health and barriers to accessing care cultural stigmas, structural and institutional racism, socioeconomic factors, discrimination, and lack of awareness all contribute to the disparities. And whereas the real world consequences of these disparities cannot be understated, overstated, at, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 2021, only 39% of black or African American adults 25% of Asian adults and 36% of Hispanic and Latino adults with mental health illness received care, compared to 52% of non-Hispanic white adults nationwide. Through their Health Disparity Hotspot Identification Initiative, the African American Health Program in Montgomery County used hospital data to map out the disparities in severity and treatment of mental illness based on zip codes, the legacy of, of explicit and de facto segregation and negligence and whereas in Montgomery County government and non-governmental organizations are allying to address and eradicate the contributors to mental illness and barriers to care experienced by our BIPOC communities partnership and collaboration with community leaders guides our path to an equitable and anti-racist health care system that meets each individual's mental health needs. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby celebrates National Minority Health Awareness Month 
and all the officials, activists, and providers working to better support our diverse population, who you see some of them behind us. And be it further resolved that the county council encourages all county residents to do the same. Presented this day, the 25th of July in the year 2023, signed by myself, Council Members Alvernaz, Sales, and Council President Glass on behalf of the entire council. Congratulations and thank you. Okay, thank you for that uh, exciting proclamation. We have one more this afternoon, and that is a proclamation recognizing World Listening Day, and that will be led by Council Member Sales. Right, everyone here for the World Listening Day proclamation, please come on down. All right, so um, I am really excited to present this proclamation today. I actually started recognizing um, World Listening Day in the city of Gaithersburg, most diverse city in the country, during a time when we were in the midst of the pandemic and we were, our students were staring into black screens on Zoom and we were all kind of shut in and not really sure about the circumstances surrounding uh, the pandemic and wanted an opportunity for our students and our community to come together outdoors and really listen to each other and have an opportunity to share how they were feeling about all of the challenges we were facing. Um, and so it's really an honor to be here to recognize this day, um, which officially took place a week ago. The actual day is July 18th, but I thought it was important to see this through on our last day um, as, um, Really grateful to be joined by some very special guests. We have Sammy Saeed, 
our 46th student member of the board. We also have Teresa Cameron, Vice President of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra at Strathmore, who will be joining us, hopefully. Um, we also have Christopher Page, Executive Director with the Conflict Resolution Center of Montgomery County, and Emma G, an award-winning artist who will deliver a special performance at the end for us. I also want to acknowledge Ricardine Cadet for being here. She's still here, Ricardine. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Ricardine is also a um, alumni of the Smart Youth Advisory Council, part of the first cohort that graduated in the spring, um, and who will um, is a rising senior at Wheaton High School. So thank you so much for being here. Um, before I turn it over to our special guest, I wanted to share a few more words to speak to the significance of this important day. Um, as I mentioned, during the pandemic, um, we witnessed the largest social movement in our history um, in support of Black Lives Matter. As I participated in protests in the county and watched others across the world, I did not feel like our leaders were taking the time to really listen to our community members who have traditionally been underserved and left behind from government decisions. Hence the theme for the event, I felt it was a moral imperative for us to bring people, particularly our young people together, so that we could hear them talk about their experiences and recommendations for policy changes in the county, which is really significant because this morning we heard from our fellows who have been working um, this past semester on issues and made some recommendations that we were all really excited to um, get started working on. Uh, today, while things have certainly changed since 2020, we still find ourselves facing some of the core issues with underlying racial disparities and inequities facing every aspect of our daily lives, which has caused us to listen and reflect and rethink what our future can be and should be. I intentionally brought these speakers together here today as listening is such a crucial part of the work that we do as elected officials. Um, and it's important that we help spread this message, whether it be through listening to music, listening to the orchestra, listening to the natural environment around us, listening to our youth, we know that our society is a much better place when we use listening to empower our diverse communities. So I wanna thank you again to our special guests for being here today. And I will now turn this over to our newly sworn in student member of the board, Sammy Saeed, to say a few words. Good afternoon to all the incredible people who have come here today. Uh, to celebrate something that's often overlooked in our world today, listening. When we think of the word listening, we may think of having to listen to long rants at business meetings or listen to people that guide us and tell us what to do. But folks, listening is far more deep than what society makes it out to be today. Listening is not just limited to the access, to the um, example of hearing just people, but instead the beautiful and calming sounds of the natural world around us. Every day, I take long walks around my neighborhood, visiting local parks, walking along sidewalks, and even passing by local schools. Though on these walks, I don't just listen to music. I listen to the sounds of the birds chirping throughout the trees. I listen to the soothing sound of the wind caressing leaves. I listen to the buzzing of bees and crickets, and all the other assortment of nature's instruments that are hiding in plain sight. There is an art to listening a love for the natural sounds of the world that have been lost in the blaring of car horns and squeal squealing brakes that pollute the modern world. Though it's never too late to take a walk in nature, no matter how comfortable your bed may be or how good that show is. Though we also have to appreciate and understand how listening shapes who we are as people. The music you listen to, the people you interact with, the, th the sounds of the world around you, they all play a little part in building up our identity. Listening makes us unique. It makes us stand out and it makes us love ourselves and the world around us. Because listening is deeper than what you look like on the outside. And while the sounds around us are heard from our ears, 
they affect us deep in our hearts. I appreciate you all so much for listening to what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you for having me here, and I hope you'll appreciate the sounds of the natural world just a little bit more after today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sammy. And next we will hear from the Executive Director of the Conflict Resolution Center of Montgomery County. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Sales, for having us here and acknowledging this special day, because that's what we do. We are the Conflict Resolution Center of Montgomery County. And we don't have people listening to nature. We don't have them listening to music. We have people in conflict listen to each other. And because a lot of times when you're in conflict, you don't want to hear what the other person says. You just want to talk. And what we do is bring mediators together to have them listen to each other. And the main thing these mediators get trained in to do is called strategic listening. They're listening for identifying feelings and values that both of them have and sharing that to each other. So if a landlord and a tenant is in a fight, we have them listen. And the landlord's main thing is he wants somebody in the space. And the person, the tenant, wants a space. And both of them value money. And how can we give each other our money? That is strategic listening. We do neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor disputes, family members. We bring them all together so that they can listen and hear from each other and show that they share the same values and most importantly, they share the same feeling. And then at the end of the day, they can do what our mission is, to strengthen our, peace, our neighborhoods and our community, piece by piece. And how do you do it? By listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And last but not least, we are going to enjoy a special performance from Emma G playing Together We Rise in an original piece on her guitar. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an honor to be here. Thank you, cast member sales. So my name is Emma G. Um, and this is, uh, this, this, this day, this celebration is near and dear to my heart. I uh, started writing music when I was super young because I needed to be heard. I had my first brain surgery when I was four months old, and I couldn't figure out how to connect with people. Fast forward to 2023, and I now have the honor and privilege to work with young people so that they too can channel their voices through the art of music, so that they can also experience conflict resolution, embrace nature, embrace each other, and more importantly, embrace themselves and the diversity that this wonderful community has to offer. Have I done enough? Do I make it up? And oh, know I've dreamed about this for so long. Am I good enough to carry on an empty page? My darling grind. Though I know it's what I need to do. Can I bear my soul and live my truth? I've read a lot after lot. If I'm hearing this story in mind, I feel it beat in my heart, causing through my veins. The magic of fear is learning to rise again, breaking the walls we built in our minds. The magic of love is to get away rise. Together we rise And I know the doubt can break us But that's never quite what makes us who we are Cause you know the way the writers Stand true to the higher power of you and I Beating my heart, causing through my veins the magic of fear, is learning to rise again, breaking the walls we built in our minds. The magic of love is to get up, we rise. Together we rise. 
Every successful child is one caring adult away. But in order to show up, we need to listen to them. We need to listen to each other. We need to rise together. That is the only way we're going to make it through, well, this world. Together we rise. Thank you. you can't have fun at work oh my gosh thank you thank you thank you emma g and i'm going to hand over a proclamation to everyone after i read this proclamation thank you again to all of our speakers thank you to my incredible staff for helping us organize this special event whereas world listening day was established in 2010 by the world listening project a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting an understanding of the world and its natural sounds and how sounds influence and shape our lives. And whereas World Listening Day takes place every year on July 18th and is dedicated to fostering understanding of the world and its natural environments, societies, and cultures through the practices of listening and observation. And whereas listening is an art that requires patience, attention to detail, and the ability to slow down, be present, and immerse ourselves in the sounds that shape our daily lives. And whereas organizations and individuals around the world celebrate World Listening Day by taking sound walks, listening to music, reducing noise pollution, practicing mindfulness, appreciating diverse perspectives, and whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the underlying racial disparities and inequities that have plagued communities of color for generations, which has caused us to listen, reflect on, and rethink what our future could be and should be. And whereas World Listening Day presents an opportunity to listen to our young leaders who work, play, and learn in our community, and will one day inherit this community, but cannot vote. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes the World Listening Day as an essential day devoted to the art of listening and being more mindful of those in our environment around us, presented on this 25th day of July in the year 2023 by Council Member Sales, Council President Glass, and the entire council. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. That was a great way to start our afternoon. Our new motto, Together We Rise. Check it out on the Apple iTunes store, um, if people still do that. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with a, a number of public hearings this afternoon. The first is a public hearing for, for the pedestrian master plan. 
On May 25th of this year, the Montgomery County Planning Board approved the pedestrian master plan, which was subsequently transmitted to the council and which we received a briefing on this morning. Uh, the pedestrian master plan is Montgomery County's first comprehensive vision to create a safer, more comfortable experience for those who are walking or rolling in our county and to make getting around more convenient and accessible for every pedestrian. The planning board draft and its appendices can be found on the planning board's website. A transportation and environment committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. Those wishing to submit testimony must do so before the close of business on August 18. We have 19 speakers for this hearing. Uh, I am going to invite the first five down to the table. Marcella Cardova, Adam Carlesco, Carrie Kasicki, Fortune McLemore, and Lawrence Cole. Okay, Ms. Cardova, we'll start with you. Thank you. Greetings, Council President and Council Members. My name is Maricela Cordova, and I am the Acting Deputy Director for Transportation Policy with the Montgomery County Department of Transportation. I appear before you today on behalf of County Executive Elridge regarding the Montgomery County Pedestrian Master Plan Draft introduced by the Planning Board on May 2023. There are many initiatives we strongly support in this plan, and we are excited to see the breadth of the recommendations. We look forward to working with Council and Planning on creating a better environment for our residents to walk and travel in. We have carefully reviewed the plan and provided detailed input, some of which has been incorporated. However, we still have substantial concerns about how some of these recommendations may be implemented. Focusing first on the scope, there are several items that overstep the authority of a master plan. To avoid conflicts and to be enable a more multi-agency means of implementation, we propose a few revisions to the recommendation section. This would recontextualize the recommendations as items suggested for multi-agency consideration by the Vision Zero Action Plan, Climate Action Plan, and other existing multi-agency efforts. The plan proposes new monitoring mechanisms which would appear to create new planning board oversight authority over the executive branch. We suggest that these monitoring efforts instead be a more robust partnership between the executive branch and planning, also using existing multi-agency partnerships and efforts. Our next, our next focus is on costs. There are many recommendations that seem appropriate, but that may exceed the resources that the county has available. We ask that council consider implementation and maintenance costs to ensure we have a prioritized plan that is achievable, does not give the public unreasonable expectations, and allows implementing agencies to achieve the goals. From a regulatory perspective, some recommendations conflict with existing code, regulations, policies, or other obligations. Where there are conflicts with items within the county's purview, the plan should identify changes necessary to the code, regulations, and policies. Some recommendations conflict with state and federal requirements, and while the county can advocate for changes, some of these items may be unlikely to change, rendering the recommendations unachievable. We ask that upcoming work sessions reconsider how to resolve these conflicts. Lastly, we ask the council give more consideration to why the area designations included in the plan there are three areas proposed to become downtowns, which we believe are more suited to town centers. If council and planning continue to consider this as downtown areas, we would seek more intensive land use and transportation infrastructure to support those designations. Similarly, there is one area that is proposed as a town center, which we believe should be designated as downtown. There are other, two other town centers which could be expanded. And we also seek a technical clarification in the plan on the Grosvenor area as raised in our written comments. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We look forward to working with the council to finalize this master plan. Thank you, Ms. Cardova. Uh, Mr. Carlesco. My name is Adam Carlesco and I live in the Wheaton area. I do not own a car. I rely upon walking, biking, and transit. Despite the current poor pedestrian experience, this county has potential. I applaud Mr. Glazer and the Planning Department for looking uh, to significantly improve the pedestrian infrastructure throughout the county, given the largely automotive focus with which this county has unfortunately developed over the past 70 years. It is important that the county recognize what exactly we are trying to protect pedestrians from. Cars. More accurately, increasingly large SUVs. There's simply no way to reach Vision Zero without significantly changing the physical infrastructure to slow speed and curtailing personal automobile use. 
As such, Section B3Cs, raised crosswalks, are the single most important thing that this county can do to improve pedestrian safety. It significantly calms traffic where it needs to be calmed as well as allows for pedestrians or wheelchair user access without forcing people to lower themselves into the street. I have personally felt it work in downtown Wheaton as well as the Netherlands where these are ubiquitous. Next, Section B4A, which seeks to build more walkable places, cannot be done through simple incentives. The county must eliminate parking minimums and instead institute parking maximums in new building designs, especially in downtowns and town centers. Additionally, Section B1F's proposal to allow for removal of off-street parking near metro or rail stations should be expanded to a full mile. It should also remove free parking from public streets to generate additional revenue and discourage personal vehicle use. Cars are the only private property that the county allows to be stored in free public rights of way. This serves as a major subsidy to drivers at the expense of everyone else. Section B9A should, be, should make flex post curb bump outs permanent and filled with native plants to allow for slow traffic at intersections, prevent flooding, reduce asphalt heating, and provide a sense of place. The intersections in this county are incredibly wide. The county also needs to recognize that the expanded access section needs to be implemented in tandem with the bike master plan because mobility lanes that work for bicycles are vital for connected wheelchair mobility networks as well. Ultimately, I support many facets of this plan. The number one problem, however, confronting pedestrians in this county is clear. Automobiles, flat out. The county must do more to pre protect pedestrians from the vehicular manslaughter that we see regularly here in this county, especially on Georgia Ave, you know, where I live. The county must do more to protect pedestrians from the uh, The county needs to do significant redesigns of major intersections, needs to focus on pedestrianization and significant bollard use in urban cores like Rockville Town Center, and needs to truly re-envision how we view public space and rights of ways. We cannot keep perpetuating car dominance and dependency, even with EVs, in a world of dwindling resources and a warming climate. The only way this county can feasibly meet its Vision Zero and climate commitment goals is through formally recognizing pedestrians as the top priority, with cars as the last transportation priority of the county, behind micromobility and transit. Anything short of that is merely pretending to protect the people of this county. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlesco. Ms. Kosicki. Good afternoon, my name is Carrie Kosicki and I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Smarter Growth, um, as well as our grassroots organization, Montgomery for All. We strongly support the Pedestrian Master Plan and we commend the plan's holistic approach to achieving pedestrian safety and comfort across the county. Um, and we particularly want to acknowledge uh, that we appreciate that the plan acknowledges pedestrian planning as a critical tool to make transit, housing, and walking work together for strong, healthy communities, safer streets, and a more environmentally friendly county. Um, I want to focus on three important parts of the plan in particular that we see as essential if we want this to be truly a strong plan that will make walking safer um, and a bigger part of transit in our county. Um, first is connecting walkability and land use. Second is making sure people can access transit safely. And third is giving the county the tools that we need to tame dangerous arterials where the majority of injuries and deaths take place. Um, so first, for recommendations on walkability and land use, the plan recommends to build more walkable places, which is essential if we truly want to transform our county into a safe and walkable place to live. Uh, we not only need to retrofit existing places and streets for safe, comfortable use, but to also think comprehensively about building walkability into our land use policies in the future, uh, both of which are key recommendations in the pedestrian master plan that we strongly support. Second, the plan has multiple recommendations on safe access to transit. Um, if we want people to use transit and switch um, from using their cars to other modes like transit and walking and biking, people have to be able to access transit safely. So prioritizing safe, comfortable pedestrian and cyclist access to transit will help make transit a desirable and climate friendly alternative to driving so that we can meet our goals of reducing emission and vehicle miles traveled. Um, and then third and finally, we commend the focus on taming dangerous arterials to transform our deadly roads into safe and walkable places. Um, especially the recommendation to transfer control of state highways to Montgomery County in downtowns, town centers, and along Thrive Growth Corridors. Um, we strongly support this, this last recommendation, which would make it faster and easier to make critical safety improvements to these deadly roads. Um, we recognize that this will be a longer term process, but we think it's really important that this is a provision of the plan so we can get started thinking about this now. Um, the acute danger to pedestrians on these roadways and these arterials is too urgent a problem for solutions to be held up by bureaucratic obstacles, which is often unfortunately the case today. 
Um, so car dependent infrastructure took a long time to develop. Um, it is our status quo. It's the dominant way of organizing our communities right now, but it doesn't have to be that way forever. Um, and this is a visionary plan that provides a deliberate and comprehensive approach to reorient ourselves towards people-centered infrastructure. We're excited to see it moving forward, um, and we would like to thank everyone who had a hand in putting this, uh, this plan together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mecklemore? Mr. Mecklemore, are you here? Okay. Mr. Cole. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Larry Cole, and for 20 years I was the Planning Department's Pedestrian Safety Coordinator. The Council adopted Vision Zero in 2016 to eliminate traffic deaths by 2030. More than half the time has elapsed, and while pedestrian injuries have been reduced, pedestrian fatalities <clears throat> excuse me, are now roughly where they were in 1999 when County Executive Duncan created the Blue Ribbon Panel on Pedestrian and Traffic Safety. This pedestrian master plan was initiated as part of the county's first Vision Zero Action Plan, but reduces the importance of pedestrian safety and is not organized to promote it. The plan fails to answer three major questions. What is our most important goal? What are the most important actions needed to achieve that goal? And who is responsible for making these things happen? I believe that pedestrian safety should be the primary goal of the plan rather than just one of four overall goals. The plan should clearly state which of the 130 recommended actions are the most important for uh, improving pedestrian safety, and it should more clearly state who needs to take the lead. 90% of the actions list multiple lead agencies obscuring both problems and solutions. The plan's goal three, pedestrian safety, has only two objectives, eliminating pedestrian fatalities and severe injuries, and the satisfaction of residents. Real safety is placed on the same footing as how residents feel about safety. But fatalities and injuries measure failure to provide a safe system. Additional proactive metrics are needed to avoid these failures. Oddly, many safety issues are discussed in a different area of the plan as metrics for resident satisfaction. So the plan proposes that rather than monitoring actual data on hazardous roadway conditions to avoid crashes, we'll just ask the public if they're satisfied. But if 52% of county residents believe that we have a safe pedestrian system right now, how will these surveys help us get to vision zero? Out of over 700,000 traffic citations in Montgomery County in the past decade, only 3,300 have been for failure to yield to a pedestrian. That's less than one per day and less than a half percent of all citations, while pedestrians are involved in 4% of all crashes and represent 27% of severe injuries and fatalities. Enforcement action to ensure pedestrian safety needs to be proportionately increased. Periodic police stings alone do not adequately address poor driver behavior. If the council still wants to achieve Vision Zero in 2030, the pedestrian master plan should be reorganized to prioritize pedestrian safety and include additional proactive metrics that the county departments of transportation and police should use to identify problems before they become pedestrian crashes. These agencies are most directly responsible for the design and operation of our roads and should be held jointly accountable for pedestrian safety. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cole, and thank you for your work over the years on this issue. Uh, thank you to all of you for providing your testimony this afternoon. Uh, next, I'd like to invite up Tony Byrne, uh, Kimberly Prasad, Benjamin Ross, Monica Reyes, and Bridget Newton Ho. Mr. Byrne, you have three minutes. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here with my wife, who's here as well. We live in North Woodside. Um, we're both runners, and so we're out and about in our neighborhood and, and adjacent neighborhoods. I also uh, work in downtown Silver Spring, where I run a small business, so I have the good fortune to be able to walk to work. Um, I read, actually, a little while ago that uh, commuting by, by walking to work uh, gives you like the neurological effects of the dopamine hit of like falling in love. Now, I don't know whether that's true, but I will say that I do love this county, um, and I love walking, and, and we love running in this county. What I don't love is the persistent feeling of, of unsafety. Um, I, I have to gird myself sometimes to cross Georgia Avenue, to cross 16th Street, even secondary arterials like Linden Lane and Seminary Road. And, and as everyone has described, it has gotten palpably worse since, since the pandemic. And so the feeling that I get, the pervasive feeling that I get, 
is that despite the great efforts of, of previous you know people working on pedestrian issues, that historically as a county we have prioritized automotive speed over pedestrian safety. Um, so I come here today in support of this comprehensive plan. Um, and from where you're sitting, and I think where others are sitting, you know, gee, you know, 130 recommendations, that sounds like a lot. We just heard that that's a lot. But it was really interesting because when I went through them, I was going like one by one, and I was like checking them off. Yep, I would do that. Yep, I've experienced that. Yep, I've experienced that. I mean, it's a comprehensive plan, you know, for a reason. And so um, it was difficult to pick out some of the recommendations that really stood out, but I wanted to just highlight about half a dozen of them. First, that sidewalks should be request driven. Um, uh, uh, process, you know, on a, rather than going from a request driven process to an equitable data driven process. Um, someone already mentioned raised crossings. Um, try to pursue a modification to the Maryland Code. I know it's a Maryland Code that people should stop as we're approaching a pedestrian crossing as opposed to when I've already put my foot out there. This would dramatically lower my blood pressure, by the way, and so my cardiologist would also thank you. Um, so, um, you know, and, and the other interesting thing here that I, that I think was really significant is uh, B9 using potential, p potential pedestrian demand instead of observed pedestrian volume. So this is, I think, from where you're sitting, maybe kind of a politically difficult thing because people will complain immediately, and this has already happened on my neighborhood lift serve, about inconvenience to their driving today as opposed to a lot of this planning has to be what is the fabric and mesh of pedestrians in the future who are going to, over time, enjoy this. So it takes some political will to do this, and my hope for you is that you will find that will. Um, and so uh, just in conclusion, this is personal for me, but, but a community issue for us all. And, and if we really believe in what Thrive talked about, walkable communities, 15-minute communities, um, then we need a comprehensive plan. And, and I'm really grateful to live in a county where uh, we have a planning commission that, with your guidance, has had the vision to create such a plan. So I hope you will move on as many of those 130 <laughs> recommendations as you can with the alacrity and seriousness that, that they deserve. Thank you. Ms. Prasad. Good afternoon. The Pedestrian Master Plan is a document written through the lens of privilege, prioritizing people who have a choice between car and bike not through the lens of a single mother, whose car, who, a single mother whose car allows her to pick up her sick child from school and return to work, nor does it take into consideration the small business owner who needs his truck, the painters, the construction workers, um, et cetera. To many, a car is not a luxury but a necessity, and that perspective also needs to be heard and taken into consideration. I'm in favor of pedestrians being a priority, such as lighting and benches to sit, especially for those physically challenged. But thought has to be given on how to mitigate the issues that we already have in existence, for example, around Wheaton and our seating situation at the Safeway store. And let's talk about the bathrooms. I'm really big into bathrooms. Uh, it's a great idea, but will it be like it is in Paris where there's someone to clean the restrooms? Or, Lord forbid, are we talking about porta potties all around Montgomery County? Um, you know, we have a serious problem with drugs, and, and crime is an everyday occurrence. So, safety has to be a part of the conversation when we're talking about uh, these external bathrooms. And the big red flag for me is knowing the funding is not there to bring this vision to fruition. And the first rule of displacement is making it unaffordable to live in our communities. And the County Council has set the wheels in motion by raising our property taxes on top of increased assessments on top of a 7% WSSC hike. Now planning is talking about raising taxes to pay for a vision that did not include the BIPOC community's voice at the table, but will disproportionately impact us. My suggestion is instead of raising taxes again, work with the budget you have by prioritizing pedestrian safety of walkers and those who are physically challenged. Starting in the top 15 voucher housing zip codes. Up County, for example, because more and more people are moving up there and the infrastructure does not support their needs. The pedestrian master plan puts an unfair burden on drivers when it should be more equitable. Suggestions, every bike rider should take 
to take a rules of the road class to become a certified writer for a fee. Um, for years, I lived in downtown Silver Spring. I rode my bike every day, five days a week to Connecticut and L. So um, I know what it's like to ride my bike every day, uh, rains, snow, and um, we don't always follow the rules of the world. So sometimes we are a danger and I think it would be beneficial if every rider, if this is gonna be the mode of transportation we're going for, that riders be required. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Good. Very good, thank you, Ms. Prasad. Mr. Ross. Good afternoon, <clears throat> I'm Ben Ross. I'm speaking today as an individual. <clears throat> uh, as someone who's researched the history of planning and I've written a book about it, I want to say that this pedestrian master plan is a groundbreaking achievement. I'm not aware of any other place in the country, and certainly not any suburb, that has comprehensively mapped the obstacles to foot travel and developed a systematic plan to overcome them the way this plan did. I, <clears throat> I expect that this plan really will stand with the Wedges and Corridors Plan and the MPDU Ordinance as a Montgomery County innovation that has na nationwide influence. It will reflect credit on the county council that adopts it, on the planning board, on the planning department, and most of all on Eli Glazer and his team who researched it and drafted it. I urge you to adopt it with an absolute minimum of alterations. <clears throat> and even more, it needs to be implemented without delay. And I have to say, uh, the uh, issues about costs ring very false to me. We have we're a county that repeatedly has spent $50, 75000000 million on a single underpass or overpass for cars that actually makes it harder to walk, um, <clears throat> thinking of Glenmont um, <laughs> uh, and, and several others. So we, <clears throat> the money is there if we balance, we need a balanced transportation plan system. We don't have a balanced transportation system, we have to, we have now an imbalanced uh, system that's balanced against people on foot. So we need to invest to correct those imbalances by focusing the investment on pedestrians. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Ms. Reyes, if you want to turn your microphone, turn your, there you go. Good, e good afternoon, um, County President and distinguished council members. The Montgomery County Council passed the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act in November 2019. The act required the planning board to consider the impact of the plan in racial equity and social justice in the county. Once again, the vision of this uh, pedestrian master plan have failed to address the um, need of the Latino community. It have no reach the minorities. However, they failed to, to reach the diversity and in inclusive. The institution continued to create plans without including those who will dispro disproportionately affected by them. Explorer uses temporary material to create dedicated pedestrian space. Their sidewalks are not accessible. Oh. There you go. Sorry. Where there is a limited available right of way or environmental or other limitation, Use flex posts, jersey barriers, or the material to create pedestrian space between the roadway. The underserved community, the answer to pedestrian safety have been direct metal fencing, which have been destroyed by drunk, drunk drivers and create the feeling in the community to be in a jailhouse because every time we have an issue, they put metal fences around. So we feel like in jailhouses all the time other than created uh, reasonable uh, barriers. Amend Montgomery County residential permit parking guideline to allow MCDOT to remove residential permit parking areas and support to another transportation purpose. What is the process to deter determine which permit parking will be removed? Will residents have any recourse or will there will be the refund to residents who have paid in full? I think that the county can remove curbside electrical vehicles changing to allow the transportation facility to be contracted. Reality, there is no parking meters. All new cars will be electric by 2030. Where do we change the electrical vehicles? 
Fine achievement of pediatric math plan vision is going to require resources that exceed current spending on pediatric and safety effort. Price parking spaces in county operated facility at market rate and use net proceed to fund pediatric bicycle and safety project in the surrounding community. Implement no regressive tax to find pedestrian and safety improvement. Include a property tax only for property assessed higher than the certain amount. Assessment has increased property value even in Aspen Hill and Wheaton. A property tax that only implies the property that changed hands after the tax is created, a recordation and increase has passed this year. That's it, do I have more time? Yeah, more time. You oh, okay. Got a few more seconds. Um, this, uh, the, the vehicle property tax on vehicles about certain value of weight, this will disproportional impact small people of color, business, social landscaping, painting, cleaning, and contractor. Then again, we ask you to have equity in all the things that you do because it's important for the community. Some people said, oh, we're going to do something for the community, and they actually don't do anything. Th thank you, Ms. Reyes. Ms. Howe. Good afternoon, I'm Bridget Howe um, from Wheaton. I want to thank the planning department in past and present, planning board leadership for this visionary and aspirational document. Um, it is truly wonderful. It'll help us create a safer county for all road users, especially pedestrians and cyclists. Um, the structure of the master plan is very good. I, I really enjoy the um, strategies that build infrastructure, build complete streets, maintaining current and future infrastructure for safety, expanding access, funding, and of course, equity uh, at the very center of it. Um, I have a few specific issues with the content of the plan. I'll follow up with that before September, but I really wanted to just speak today about my, my particular concern, that master plans are words on paper. They are words on paper that become documents and binders that often get put on shelves <laughs> and don't necessarily get acted on. And this is too important a, a situation, too important a document for that to happen. So I really wanna just urge you to approve this and also urge you to then follow through with the funding and action that will help these recommendations come to life. Um, in the time that has taken for this plan to be drafted, hundreds of pedestrians and cyclists have been struck by drivers. 59 have died, pedestrians and cyclists, since 2020. Um, hundreds of requests for sidewalks have been submitted to the county and only just a handful have been built, including several that I've submitted, none of which have been built. Um, school children get hazard bused every day because they can't safely access schools on foot. Lack of sidewalk maintenance and safe crossings have led to really um, terrible tragedies. To give some examples, just in the time since they started this plan, so since you know 2019, um, I've seen the following: lack of sidewalks and lack of safe access on secondary of crossings on secondary roads mean that the Title I Elementary School in my Wheaton neighborhood has hazard buses. Uh, multiple hazard buses, which of course is a climate issue. Uh, lack of sidewalks in my neighborhood actually led to some teens being harassed by police because they were walking in the street. They couldn't, there were no sidewalks for them to walk on. Um, lack of maintenance and clear delineation of state versus county responsibility means that sidewalks along University Boulevard in my neighborhood are frequently blocked by dead animals and overgrown brush. My that is a stretch of sidewalk that serves residents of Inwood House, who many of whom have mobility challenges. Uh, the pilot university bike lane, which made road users safer, but was discontinued, discontinued by the state despite evidence showing only minor inconveniences, also happened in that time. Uh, the approval and construction of multiple schools in my cluster that lack design for safe pedestrian access. I'm speaking specifically about Odessa Shannon in Northwood High School, and I'll follow up with specific concerns. And of course, we all know that the victims of traffic violence are more likely to be elderly, low-income, immigrant, members of our community, and BIPOC. All of this to say, please approve this plan. I appreciate that, but I also ask you to make this a reality by committing to enacting and funding those actions. Um, as Council Member Jawando said this morning, these fatalities are not accidents, but are based on past infrastructure decisions. We need to be really intentional to correct those past decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howe. Thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. We have four more people who will be testifying in person. Uh, Douglas Taylor, Kevin Walton, Patricia Mulready and Nader Hojaji.
Okay, Mr. Taylor. Um, good afternoon. I am Joan McDermott, president of the Kensington Estate Civic Association. I'm speaking for Doug Taylor. Uh, he is a member of our Traffic and Safety Committee who is scheduled to speak and he submitted written personal testimony last week about uh, the cycle and pedestrian lanes planned for Knowles Avenue between Beach Drive and Summit Avenue. Doug's wife has an emergency uh, dental procedure today. <laughs> um, we agree that pedestrians and bicycles should have safe passage, specifically between Rock, uh, Rock Creek Trail and Summit Avenue. The county pedestrian plan shows that the dedicated bicycle lanes will be placed along the Knowles Roadway. However, we need to think beyond the impact of the, uh, the impact of the trail beyond just moving bikes from point A to point B. We need to consider all of the impacts in the area and the bike path should not be considered in isolation. Knowles is a busy street with through traffic headed for Connecticut Avenue or downtown Kensington on the other side of Connecticut. The Summit Knowles intersection is snarled for hours in the morning, evening, and during lunchtime every single day. In addition, stormwater runoff and flooding has been a huge problem for all the properties on the south side of Knowles and the adjoining Warren Street, which is where Doug Taylor lives. Um, repeated uh, recent and proposed apartment and retail development is adding pressure to the already strained traffic and, uh, and stormwater infrastructure. Expanding the sidewalk on the south side of Knowles to create the bike path creates the most problems. A south path would first create additional impermeable surfaces and drain water into an already overloaded sewer system. It would secondly disrupt the recently installed utility lines Thirdly, crosses two streets and many driveways. And fourth, forces the bicycle traffic into this already overwhelmed intersection. And there's no clear pathway for the bicycles to proceed in any direction from that point. The north side of the street was identified by bicycle groups as a safer, simpler option. There are few residences. There's only one street to cross, but crossing Howard Avenue would be dangerous and a raised sidewalk would be helpful. There are alternative, better pathways for bicycle traffic from Rock Creek Parkway to Summit with a couple, uh, within a couple of blocks. The footpath from Pliers Mill to Rock Creek Trail um, crosses no streets. It has uh, the most, more comprehensive changes would be needed to mitigate any modification in the Knowles itself, so the cost would be significantly lower if we do not use the Knowles area. Um, we urge in the strongest possible terms that these measures be studied specifically for this portion um, with great care and a full report on the water and traffic impacts be completed with the impact from our civic association before the plan for that segment proceeds any farther. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, Mr. Walton. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Walton and I'm here on behalf of the Climate Coalition of Montgomery County. The coalition represents 20 Montgomery County-based organizations working to address climate change and sustainability. We are in favor of the pedestrian master plan. As noted in the PMP, for much of the 20th century, the Montgomery County transportation system was designed for motor vehicle traffic to the exclusion of people walking and biking. The goal of the PMP is to reverse this, and we applaud the effort. However, we also want to provide some thoughts about how the PMP and its climate assessment could be made even stronger. There are really two parts to the PMP. One, as noted in the plan, is to develop a safe, comfortable, and appealing network for walking, biking, and rolling, ensuring safety, comfort, convenience, and accessibility. We appreciate the plan's focus, as well as its emphasis on equity and commitment to transit. The other part is its role in climate mitigation. The county's climate action plan notes that greenhouse gas emissions from on-road transportation account for about one-third of the county's 20, uh, 2018 emissions. A few statements in the PMP refer to lowering vehicle miles traveled, but there is no quantitative assessment. The plan should be clear on how it will reduce the need for individual cars. We must acknowledge that the pedestrian master plan is essentially a climate plan. As such, the PMP should emphasize the relationship between our existential climate crisis and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by encouraging people to transition out of cars. This messaging will help planners develop a more effective plan. 
It also helps the general public understand why this effort is critical, as ultimately they are the ones that need to transition. Which leads me to the other part of the process of improving the PMP, that of its climate assessment. This is the Planning Board's first climate assessment. We understand the approach for conducting climate assessments is a work in progress, and we hope our comments are taken uh, as suggestions on how to improve this process. We greatly appreciate that the PMP was generally determined to have a positive impact on addressing the county's greenhouse gas emissions. However, the assessment is only qualitative. Some elements should have a quantitative evaluation. This may be due to the absence of quantitative measures in the plan itself for items like vehicle miles traveled, as you already mentioned. Plans like the PMP need to include these quantitative measures in order for the climate assessment to fully evaluate its impact. Second, we understand that there would be on ongoing public access to review the developing climate assessment during the plan planning process. However, we only saw the final, final assessment after the public hearing was scheduled. Third, the assessment document does not show its work. That is how the conclusions were reached. Without appropriate documentation, it is impossible to evaluate the conclusions. And lastly, we expected inclusion of recommendations for how to improve the climate outcomes. Solely noting a negative effect is only half the process. The climate assessment law requires the planning department to offer recommendations for mitigating any negative impacts. We want to depend on the climate assessment to give the county guidance on how the plan could be more climate friendly. In conclusion, uh, the Climate Coalition of Montgomery County supports the adoption of the Desert Master Plan, and we look forward to its implementation. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Walton. Ms. Mul Mulready. Hi. I'm here today to um, ask you to please respect historic districts and buildings when you're considering the um, uh, pedestrian master plan. There's only one mention in the entire thing, and yes, I've read it both pre parks and planning and after, um, in that whole thing, um, which is unacceptable. Um, such disrespect and not noticing that such neighborhoods, historic districts and buildings have their own character and that's why they were made historic districts. They should be allowed to exist as they are, especially when there are alternative routes through neighborhoods, even safer that people could use to get to, we'll say like in the Kensington area, uh, to downtown Kensington. Also, you should recognize that both the Montgomery County Department of um, Transportation and um, SHA have told people on Capitol View Avenue that if sidewalks go in, first of all, all the trees come out. Sidewalks are trees, can't have both. And that we, homeowners, would be responsible for every cost. So if a retaining wall has to go in, we have to pay it. If a driveway needs to be reinstalled and specialty items put there, we have to pay it after losing our 100 plus year old trees that we've spent thousands and thousands of dollars to take care of. Um, I also, because I'm going to run out of time, rural areas are important and you shouldn't be putting cement pathways through you know, extended areas of parks. But um, I had to walk to school a mile each way, so did my brothers. And it is, I mean, ideally, yes, it's nice, but if we keep having weather like we had last week or when it's really cold, it's miserable. Kids get harassed. The idea of this grouping together and we're all going to walk really nicely to school is really a very nice idea. But I can guarantee you that that is not what kids and their parents do. Um, also, for, par um, for young girls, so preteens and teens, and perimenopausal women, staff and faculty, they want all of these people to walk two miles to get to school or work, which could be a horrible, horrible experience. If you want ex explicit examples, I can provide them during Q&A 
or during private conversation. And yes. I have no idea what time I have. Your, your time is up. Your timing right. was pretty good there. Um, thank you. But Ms. Mulready, thank you for that testimony. Um, is Nader Hojaji here? Okay, with that, that concludes this panel. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Uh, we now have five individuals who will be joining us virtually, uh, the first of whom is Herb Simmons. Mr. Simmons is not here yet. Okay. Uh, next is Michael Hale. Hello, can you hear me all right? We hear you and see you. Great, thank you. Let me adjust that. Uh, good afternoon, County Council members. My name is Mike Heil, and I'm providing comments today on behalf of the Byford Rock Creek Highlands Citizens Association in Kensington. Thank you for having this important meeting. The safety of all residents of Montgomery County is certainly a priority that we all share. In light of this interest in safety, <clears throat> we do have concerns with Section B4G of the Pedestrian Master Plan, which seeks to make the weekend closures on Beach Drive permanent. Our neighborhood runs parallel to a 0.6 mile stretch of Beach Drive that's closed every weekend and holiday. The section of Beach Drive provides access to Connecticut Avenue right at the intersection of the Capitol Beltway. By design, it takes traffic but between Walter Reed, NIH, Bethesda, Rockville, and the Beltway seven days a week. Since April of 2020, our neighborhood has experienced a significant and unsafe increase of non-local cut through commuter traffic whenever Beach Drive is closed. But rather than listening to our repeated concerns, we've been referred to in a derogatory manner by county personnel and are now faced with a pedestrian master plan that is actually seeking to make these weekend closures permanent at the expense of our safety and our well-being. When Beach Drive is closed, cars are forced to use our neighborhood as a cut through. Our neighborhood does not have sidewalks, has narrow streets with cars parked on both sides of it, has families with children, has several blind spots and has no traffic calming measures of which to speak. And the volume of cars is not trivial. MC DOT data show an increase of traffic volume of well over 100% each weekend when Beach Drive is closed. One day we had over 1,000 cars. I ask, how does funneling this many cars onto a narrow residential street never intended to, to take this volume of traffic meet the goals of the pedestrian master plan, let alone Vision Zero? Closing Beach Drive also does not meet the goal of creating a comfortable, connected, convenient pedestrian network. This is because a paved pedestrian footpath already runs parallel to Beach Drive and has since the 1970s. The county's provided zero data or basis, which even suggests that the existing pathway is somehow not adequate. And speaking of data, the county has a significant lack of it. First, Parks conducted no research or diligence on potential spillover traffic impacts before the closures went into effect. Parks also has no data showing the actual volume of foot traffic on the, six, the 6 mile section of Beach Drive that parallels our neighborhood. And on the section where users are counted, they're counted up to up, up to four different times. And these are the numbers that the county is using to support the popularity of the closures. Safer alternatives exist and need to be considered to meet the needs of pedestrians, bicyclists, and residents alike. For example, Establishing barricaded bike lanes along Beach Drive would provide safe access for bicyclists 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We urge the County Council to modify or delay the implementation of Section B4G of the Master Plan so that safer alternatives can be considered. Rushing a permanent closure of Beach Drive is dangerous, does not meet the stated goals of the Master Plan, and is not supported by any meaningful data. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Eric Heron. Good afternoon. I'm speaking on behalf of the Action Committee for Transit, Montgomery County's Advocates for Better Transportation. I'll be very brief. This is a terrific document. Don't change a word of it. Pass it and then implement it without delay in full. Thank you very much. Thank you. That might have been a speed record here. Uh, uh, Mr. Grimes, Seth Grimes joining us next. Seth Grimes here. Oh, yes. Okay, we will go to Leah Nielsen. Oh, there you are, Seth. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, thank you. 
My name is Seth Grimes. I am Washington, I'm sorry, a Maryland organizer with the Washington Area Bicyclist Association, which represents over 1,000 Montgomery County members. We envision a just and sustainable transportation system where walking, biking, and transit are the best ways to get around. The draft pedestrian master plan is excellent work. We commend acting director Stern and her predecessors and Mr. Glazer and his colleagues. The plan's design policy and programming recommendations are sensible and comprehensive. We appreciate the extensive data collection and analysis performed and planning staff survey efforts and attention to equity. The plan will advance Montgomery County in our efforts toward Vision Zero. We appreciate that the plan recognizes that bicycle and pedestrian safety are linked. We, of course, are a bicyclist organization. A chapter describes bicycle and pedestrian priority areas, BIPAs. A uh, funding program is one of the primary ways that the county funds pedestrian and bicycle improvements. It describes prioritization around uh, different contexts and including an equity focus. This prioritization would be used for all new capital improvement program projects that address pedestrian and bicycle safety and connectivity. So I will focus on three particular aspects. As I said, overall, we view the plan as excellent. I will point out that it is, well, not actually in the plan. It is imperative that the county council and executive fund the actual work. I'll provide two examples, current examples, where you have not done so, but can still. Uh, Montgomery County Department of Transportation is planning median bus rapid transit bus lanes for US 29 as it designated BIPAs, again, bicycle and pedestrian priority areas along the corridor. However, neither the county nor the State Highway Administration has funded construction of the US 29 side path, key to pedestrian and bicycle safety in that corridor, that is indicated by the county's bicycle master plan. You should work with the state to create those master planned bikeways. It's not enough to plan, you have to fund. Second example is Veers Mill Road, where you have funded bicycle and pedestrian improvements for the Veers Mill Randolph BIPA, linked to BRT construction, but not for Veers Mill Road and the Wheaton Central Business District, another BIPA. Downtown Wheaton is an equity focus area. Please expedite that work as well. Uh, comment number two. Uh, the rollout of context and corridor-based planning should not delay a key reform area-wide speed limit reductions per the pedestrian master plan's recommendation P9. We recognize vehicle speed has a very significant impact on injury and death of everyone involved in the collision. The District of Columbia has a 25 mile an hour speed limit as observed in the pedestrian master plan. A change to Maryland state law would be required. A bill did not pass this last session. We hope that you will back a bill to allow reduction of speed limits with area-wide complete streets plans in the coming session. Finally, we oppose pedestrian master plan's recommendation P8B to increase in-person traffic enforcement activities. WABA supports the STEP Act introduced by Council Member Jawanda with Council Member Mink's support. This recommendation runs counter to that act. Overall, the pedestrian master plan is excellent work and we urge you to implement it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grimes. Now we'll go to uh, Leah Nielsen. Dear council members, first of all, thank you for your demonstrated commitment to pedestrian safety. I believe this plan is a step in the right direction. I'm here today as a student to suggest an emphasis on the reduction of excessive wait times to cross major roads in Montgomery County, in particular Old Georgetown Road, in this pedestrian master plan, and I urge you to adopt and take this seriously. As a high school student, I use the J2 bus frequently. The journey from my house to the nearest bus stop should take about two minutes, according to the Ride On app, but I have to leave much earlier than that in order to accommodate the nearly two minute wait at the intersection of Old Georgetown and Beach Avenue. While two minutes may not seem like a long time, it is enough to miss a bus you had been on time for and watch it go past you from the other side of the street. It is not normal or fair that I and other pedestrians should miss our buses because of an inability to cross the street quickly. Over the last few years, Montgomery County has come out with a number of initiatives regarding pedestrian safety and accommodation, and yet we still must wait disproportionately longer than cars at signals. I come before you today to ask you to consider making it a priority of the pedestrian master plan to shorten wait times at busy intersections. This entails shorter traffic cycle lengths and longer walk intervals. For example, pedestrians are given only about 23 seconds to cross Old Georgetown, which is not enough time, especially considering the extended amount of time given to cars during their respective cycles. This short crossing time also affects pedestrians who might arrive at the crosswalk after the beginning of the walk cycle, forcing them to rush across the intersection or begin crossing without enough time for completion. According to a study, at the 244 intersections where pedestrian crossing time was increased, the average pedestrian crash rate decreased by 50%. Annually, nearly 400 pedestrians are struck by vehicles in Montgomery County, and a good number of these pedestrian incidents occurred on intersections of Old Georgetown Road prior to the installation of the bike lanes. 
While the bike lanes have done good work, I still see many close calls between pedestrians and vehicles at these intersections. By increasing the amount of time pedestrians have to cross the street, you may reduce the amount of pedestrians crossing against the signal and or getting stuck in an unsafe median, thereby continuing the prevention of pedestrian incidents in the county. The feelings of drivers who have to wait a little longer at intersections do not outweigh the benefits of creating a safer environment for pedestrians. Additionally, the short crossing time at major roads means that if you miss one cycle or arrive at the end of one, you will have to wait longer for another. According to a study on the effects of wait time on pedestrian compliance, pedestrian compliance with the don't walk signal was inversely related to the amount of signal wait time at the crossing. With shorter wait times, the safety of the community will improve, and it is imperative that we pay attention to this considering the increase in traffic fatalities over the past few years, both nationwide and countywide. Council members, the reason I am so passionate about this issue is because I firmly believe that the future of Montgomery County is one with far fewer cars and far more pedestrians, bikes, buses, and trains. For the environment, for quality of life, and for the general well-being of the community, I urge you to take the pedestrian master plan seriously and recognize that we must do everything we can to ensure a safe and enjoyable experience for pedestrians in Montgomery County. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'll give one more call for Herb Simmons to see if he's joined us, and he has still not joined us. Okay. Um, I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining us this afternoon in person and virtually uh, for this incredibly important topic. We received a briefing uh, just before uh, we recessed by the planning board on the pedestrian master plan. We will take it up in the fall, um, just also as we will take up the Safe Streets Act. Uh, which has a number of corresponding elements to it. Uh, and the bottom line here is that in the year 2023, the first six months of this year, 320 of our neighbors have been hit while walking or biking in our neighborhood, and nine have been tragically killed. That is why this is important, and I appreciate everybody coming today to talk about this important issue. And with that, this hearing is now closed. The next item on the agenda is a public hearing on Zoning Text Amendment 2305, Vehicle Parking Design Standards, Commercial Vehicle Parking for Properties with a Residential Use. This ZTA will expand the options for parking certain vehicles in an R200, R90, R60, and R40 zones. A Planning Housing Parks Committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business on August 5th. And we have two speakers for this hearing. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, Ben Burbert to join us, and we have one more joining us virtually. Mr. Burbert, you have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Ben Berbert. I'm here representing the Montgomery County Planning Board and providing testimony on Zoning Text Amendment 2305. The Montgomery County Planning Board had the opportunity to meet about this Zoning Text Amendment and in a 5-0 vote is recommending its support of the Zoning Text Amendment as it's introduced. Uh, as suggested, the, uh, this affects the uh, commercial vehicle parking allotment in the R200, R90, R60, and R40 zones. Currently in these zones, you are allowed to park up to one recreational vehicle and one light commercial vehicle on lot. This zoning text amendment would keep that provision, but also allow a second option where you could have two light commercial vehicles with no recreational vehicle on lot. The planning board finds that this is beneficial. There are a lot of uh, households in our community that might have more than one individual that works in a, some sort of service or other construction industry. It might have a take home vehicle that is qualified as a light commercial vehicle. And this would provide an opportunity to not have to park these all over our streets, but actually get them off lot and on, or off street and onto the lots. As part of its assessment, we did do a climate assessment as required. Um, the impacts of the climate assessment were considered very minor. Generally, were also considered to be negative. There is a possibility that as this is implemented, there could be an encouragement to expand driveways to accommodate this extra vehicle. Um, Although it is indeterminable as to where exactly that would happen or to how much this would happen, our assumption is it would not be something that would occur very frequently. Um, there was actually a, uh, also a concern that there could be an increase to vehicle miles traveled of these light commercial vehicles, which do tend to pollute more than cars. But that is also a very indeterminate effect that might happen. Um, there is a slight positive that was uh, gleaned from this, from the uh, that there could be better accessibility and distribution of economic resources to various households if this provision is allowed to go through. 
So in summary with that, Planning Board is supportive of the zoning text amendment and planning staff of the Planning Board is available to assist Council as it delivers this further. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Uh, joining us virtually is Carl Wilkerson. Mr. Wil Wilkerson. Yes, good afternoon. It took a moment to get unmuted. My name is Carl Wilkerson. I live in Bethesda. And I oppose this zoning text amendment because the scope, purpose, and legislative language need precision and clear justification. One of the core elements of this is the definition of light commercial vehicle and juxtaposed heavy commercial vehicle. While those definitions have been in the uh, zoning ordinances for many years, there has been a recent history where the Board of Zoning Appeals and the hearing examiners have interpreted a zoning text amendment 0903 to have permitted full-size school buses to have been moved from the heavy commercial category into the light commercial category. The impact in these instances has been that 17 school buses have been permitted to park within 100 feet of R60 residential homes, starting up their engines, diesel engines at 5 a.m. in the morning for an hour and adding particulate matter. It was an uh, inappropriate and incorrect interpretation of the legislative language and the council's legislative intent in that prior zoning text amendment. But until the correct effective definition of heavy and light commercial vehicle is clarified, it would be premature to go forward with this proposed zoning text amendment. With regard to the um, climate impact that the former speaker, uh, prior speaker just mentioned, um, none of those conclusions were supported by metrics or uh, quantitative justifications. They say in several places that it has unpredictable negative impact on green cover, greenhouse gas, and on uh, impervious cover. Basically, it means we don't have any idea how many people are going to be parking two commercial vehicles in the driveway and how many will do it. So to go forward on the zoning text amendment until there's greater clarity on the climate impact and the neighborhood impact uh, would be regrettable. So in sum, uh, I would like to suggest that there are unintended, unintended negative consequences here that could transform residential uh, zoning into industrial zones. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilkerson. Uh, with that, this hearing is now closed. Uh, next is a public hearing on the transfer of unexpended project balance within the FY24 capital budget and amendments to the FY23 to 28 capital improvements program, Montgomery County Public Schools from multiple construction projects to MCPS local unliquidated surplus account in the amount of $3,400,000. Action is scheduled immediately after the public hearing and there are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve the transfer of unexpected project balance within the FY24 capital budget and amendments to the FY23 to 28 capital improvements program for Montgomery County Public Schools for multiple construction projects to the MCPS local unliquidated surplus account in the amount of three million four hundred dollars. Three million four hundred thousand dollars. Uh, moved by Councilmember Ludke, seconded by Councilmember Sales. Uh, all those in favor? And that is unanimous by all those present. Next is a public hearing on the transfer of unexpended project balance within the FY24 capital budget and amendment to the FY23 to 28 capital improvements program, Montgomery County Public Schools, from MCPS local unliquidated surplus account. Yep. Uh, in the amount of $3,400,000 to multiple, multiple construction projects. Action is scheduled immediately after a public hearing, and there are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Uh, is there a motion to approve the transfer of unexpected project balance within the FY24 capital budget 
and amendment to the FY 23 to 28 capital improvements program Montgomery County Public Schools from MCPS local unliquidated surplus account in the amount of three million four hundred thousand dollars to multiple construction projects moved by Councilmember Ludke seconded by Councilmember Katz all those in favor and that is unanimous Councilmember Jawanda. Uh, if I could just be recorded as voting yes for the previous item. Thank you. Without objection. Next is a public hearing on a special appropriation to the FY24 operating budget uh, for community grants, non departmental account in the amount of $1,500,000 for the nonprofit technical assistance and management support grants and the underserved communities projects grants program. The source of funds are general funds, undesignated reserves. Action is scheduled immediately after this public hearing and there are no speakers for this public hearing so this public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve these funds? Moved by Council Member Ludke, seconded by Council Member Stewart. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, uh, Councilmember Balcom, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to mention that um, this is our first uh, supp uh, special appropriation. We talked last year throughout the budget about getting a rolling tally. As this is this is the first one, we don't need a rolling tally, but just uh, communicating to staff that we we're, we're hoping to see that in future appropriate supplementals and specials. So thank you. Appreciate you raising that. It was something we did discuss at the budget. Uh, all those in favor of this item? That is unanimous. <coughs> Next is a public hearing on a special appropriation to the FY24 operating budget for Montgomery County Government Office of the County Executive. Uh, $198,000, 500, uh, $198,594 for community use of public facilities, $60,000 for the Department of Health and Human Services, and $20,000 for summer and after school youth safety programs. And the source of funds are a state grant. Action is scheduled immediately after the public hearing, and there are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve this special appropriation? Uh, moved by Council Member Katz, seconded by Council Member Jawando. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Next is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the FY24 capital budget and amendments to the amended FY23 to 28 capital improvements program for the amount of $105,003 for the sustainability initiatives project and the source of funds are state aid. Action is scheduled immediately after this public hearing and there are no speakers for this public hearing so this public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve this supplemental appropri appropriation for the capital budget and amendments to? Second. Uh, moved by Councilmember Ludke, seconded by Councilmember Sales. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. The last public hearing for the afternoon is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the FY24 operating budget of Montgomery County Public Schools for the amount of $2,513,686 for supply chain assistance funds. And the source is a state grant. Action is scheduled immediately after this public hearing. There are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve this supplemental appropriation? Uh, moved by Councilmember Ludke, seconded by Councilmember Stewart. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. We are now going to move into legislative session, legislative day number 23. 
and there are two bills for introduction today. The first is Bill 3223, Police Policing, uh, Policing Advisory Commission Amendments, sponsored by Council Member Ludke. A public hearing is scheduled for September 12th at 1.30. Council Member Ludke. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, today I'm introducing Bill 3223, a new and evolved version of Bill 2723, which we'll get to a little, little bit at item 13 on our agenda, and I'll speak to that when that comes. The intent that I had in the other bill was to remove and repeal the existing body and create a new one, but because there was a timing issue with the membership of that board set to expire on July 31st, I did not do them both at the same time. Um, but rather than amending the prior bill, which we talked about and we came, had a discussion at the Public Safety Committee, um, decided it would be better to withdraw that, which is about to happen, and introduce the new bill. It's critical that we have a place and space to have difficult and necessary conversations about policing in our communities. That space has to be balanced with members who have a wide range of views and positions on various issues. Every member needs to be able to sit at the table and know that their voice is as significant as everyone else's. It's clear that we need to do something to adjust that on the existing PAC. It was clear to the public as well, as this is an issue that continues to come up regularly. We receive a lot of constituent mail about this issue, and it is something that arose again at my public safety uh, community meeting at the end of June. Presently on the PAC, there are currently three vacancies. There will be four as of August the 1st, a body that three years after the body was originally created retains only six of the original members serving their terms. Two of the existing vacancies are executive appointments. The PAC has an annual reporting requirement. The entity's annual report that was due on July 1st of 2022 was never submitted. And the report due on July 1st, 2023 was also never submitted to the council. So there are things that we need to do to figure out how to make things run better um, and to make sure the body is more effective and is providing the forum as well as the output and advice to the council that was anticipated when it was originally created. We also need to do some housekeeping matters to make sure we're addressing the fact that in the prior iteration, um, there were nine appointments each by an, an individual council member, and we now have 11 members of the council. Um, so in this new bill, unlike the previous situation where every council member would appoint a member, every person who will be a member of this new body will be approved by the full council. When there is a vacancy, the full council will assess the viable candidates who have submitted applications to serve and expressed interest and vote on the person who will fill that vacancy. This is an incredibly, tremendously important topic to the public. I know that several council members and their staff have fielded questions from the public about how to make official complaints against the police as well, which is a separate issue and is covered by the PAB that went into effect on July 1st of this year. Um, the current level of outreach by the PAC is not seeming to reach the average resident in the ways that we may have desired. Um, and is really reaching those who are already attuned with these issues as opposed to providing broad uh, community outreach and education. My hope is that this new amended entity will conduct robust direct outreach to the community, especially in communities where residents are more likely to have interactions with police. I also think that it's important that the police are fully represented on the commission as voting members. We do have voting agency represent representation on other county boards, committees, and commissions, especially when it comes to public safety topics like our juvenile justice system, pedestrian bicyclist safety, and the criminal justice coordinating commission. Um, so one of the things that I very much wanted to clarify in this because the acronyms, and I know we are the government and acronyms are a part of our day in day out life, 
is the difference between the PAC and the PAB, and to an ordinary resident, this is just a very confusing thing. So I have given this a new name that does not have an acronym that sounds too much like the PAB, which is in fact the body that is designated to receive complaints about officers or agencies within the county. Um, so I look forward to continuing this discussion uh, and having the public hearing on this at the September 12th next council session. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Saccone to add any other clarifying points. Uh, good afternoon, council president and council members. I have nothing to add. I just would point to page two of the staff packet for a summary of the bill specifics. You covered most of them. There may be a couple of others that are also listed at page two. Thank you, Council Member. Um, thank you, Ms. Saccone. Uh, not seeing any other comments from the dais. Uh, this bill is introduced. Thank you. The second bill for introduction today is Bill 3323, Police Voluntary Registry for Emergency 911 Calls Established. Sponsored by Council Member Lutke. A public hearing is scheduled for September 12th at 1.30 p.m. Council Member Lutke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Bill 3323 would establish a voluntary flagging program within Montgomery County for those with differing abilities and unique health needs in order to receive a more effective emergency response and in order to help inform our public safety professionals of things that might help them better arrive on scene. Um, this voluntary 911 registry would allow individuals or their caregivers to notify first responders via creation of a form to be designated by the Montgomery County Police Department that someone at their address may be nonverbal, for example, sensitive to loud noises or bright lights, prone to avoid eye contact or exhibit other traits to help public safety professionals better support them during a call for emergency services. An individual and or their caretaker can choose to provide any necessary information by registering online It's not at no cost and the registrations would be done annually. Um, it is the responsibility of the resident or caretaker to update the program with any changes um, and prior to the conclusion they would receive a notification that they need to renew. Information is shared on a need to know basis by the through the um, computer aided dispatch system. I was about to use another acronym again and I didn't, I caught myself. Um, so it creates a flag within the CAD system, which is the computer aided dispatch system. Um, this model is not something I concocted on my own. It's something that's been well established within Howard County um, starting back in 2012. And I had the privilege of learning about their program and, um, and how it worked about five years ago while I was still working with the state. Um, and there, Lieutenant William Chevron and the Howard County Police Department uh, worked and collaborated with uh, members of the disabilities community um, to put this together. It's been up and running for over a decade with great uh, success. Community members have praised the presence and visibility of the Howard County Police Department and the measures the first responders have taken to ensure the security and safety of those with intellectual, developmental, physical, or mental disabilities. Um, and I want to thank Lieutenant Chevron for coming and talking to our stakeholders here in Montgomery County. We did uh, make sure that we out, uh, did outreach to uh, the different agencies that would be affected by this um, within our public safety agencies and the emergency call center to address any potential hurdles and establish the, establish the most po pos best possible program for our communities. Um, there are two other counties that since Howard County came online with this have also adopted this approach, that's Cecil County and Charles County. I'm thankful for the support of Council President Evan Glass and Council Members Gabe Abernaz, Friedson Katz, and Kate Stewart, who are co-sponsors of this legislation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Saccone. Thank you. Um, you, you covered it uh, <laughs> in full, so I have nothing to add to the details of the bill, but just to also note, the reason the package is noted as corrected is because Council Member Katz had informed us prior to the, the packet going out that he was a co-sponsor, and today we have learned that uh, Council Member Fanny Gonzalez is also a sponsor, so that will be noted in the next packets. Thank you. We've got the whole fourth floor. This is exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. The whole fourth floor, yes. There you go. 
Um, uh, thank you very much, Councilman Reludke. And with that, that legislation is introduced. So we're going to move from bill introductions to final readings. There are seven bills for final reading today. The first is expedited bill 2327, Police Advisory Commission repeal. Councilmember Ludke. Thank you. It's, uh, so it's bill 2723, correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Yes. So, just want to make sure I say it correctly. As an original sponsor of expedited bill 2723, I move to withdraw bill 2723 pursuant to Council Rules of Procedure 6G. Councilmember Ludke moves to withdraw bill 2723. Is there a second? Second. Uh, seconded by Councilmember Katz. Um, any comment? Not seeing any. This is a roll call vote. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Ludke? Yes. Councilmember Ludke votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fowney Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fowney Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Bill 2723 is repealed. Uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much. If we could make certain that it is clear on air agenda, this says 2327, and this, just to be thoroughly confusing on everything, this was 2723, so if we could make certain that that's clear. Thank you. That is correct. Uh, either way the numbers are written, the Police Advisory Commission has been, uh, the bill to amend it has been repealed. Um, next bill for final reading is expedited bill 1923, Police de uh, Department of Police Pension and DSRP Adjustments. The GO Committee recommends enactment. I'll turn it over to the chair of that committee, Councilmember Stewart. Great, thank you. Uh, it, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee unanimously recommends the enactment of Bill 19-23 as uh, introduced. This was an expedited bill requested on behalf of the County Executive as a result of the negotiations between the Executive Branch and the Paternal Order of Police, uh, Montgomery County Lodge 35, uh, for the collective bargaining agreement that took effect on July 1st, 2023. In our approval of the FY24 operating budget, the council appropriated FY24 funding to implement uh, Bill 19-23. However, this funding is contingent upon enactment of the bill and why it is before us today. And I know uh, Ms. Wellens and Ms. Ciccone are here if anyone has any questions on the details. That's all. Very good. Any additional comments? Not seeing any comments. Um, is a roll call vote. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Ludke? Yes. Councilmember Ludke votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fonny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fonny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. We have three of them. I know, I'm looking. <laughs> I'm just checking. That's it. Uh, next bill for final reading is expedited bill 2023, um, OPT, STL bargaining units, pension and retirement adjustments. Uh, the GO committee recommends enactment. Chair Stewart. This is a, pretty much the same as we just did uh, for uh, the police, except this is the Montgomery County um, Municipal and County Government Employees Organization, a UFCW local 1994 McGeo. Um, again, in our approval of our FY24 operating budget, the council appropriated FY24 funding to implement Bill 20-23. However, that is contingent upon enactment of the, this bill, and the GEO committee unanimously recommended this as well. 
Madam Clark, please call the roll. Councilmember Lupe? Yes. Councilmember Lupe votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fana Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fana Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Uh, and the third of the trio bills for final rating coming out of a GO this afternoon is expedited bill 2123 fire and rescue services credited service for group G members. The GO committee recommends enactment. Chair Stewart. Yep, and this is our final one um, with our Montgomery County Career Firefighters Association and International Association of Firefighters Local 1664. AFL-CIO, um, we again recommend um, this move forward. This is again uh, appropriated in our FY24 funding, but to implement it, we need to enact this bill. And I would just wanna say thank you to all our union representatives um, who worked on this, uh, worked through collective bargaining with the county executive in Okuyo today. That's all. Uh, echo that sentiment. Thank you for everybody in the room uh, for supporting our residents, keeping them safe. With that, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Ludke? Yes. Councilmember Ludke votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Glass. Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to everybody serving and protecting our residents. Uh, us, our sixth bill, sixth bill for final reading this afternoon. Uh, no, it was the fifth. It's that kind of afternoon. <laughs> Fifth, sixth, right? I was so unsure I said it twice. Um, <laughs> the next bill for final reading is Bill 2823, Taxation Fuel Energy Tax Green Bank. Uh, uh, I will say that the Transportation and Environment Committee uh, recommends uh, enactment of this bill. Uh, and the reason we've done so and the reason that the committee uh, jointly uh, introduce this bill is because um, last session, last term of uh, the council, uh, we supported a 10 percent, uh, we supported that 10 percent of the fuel tax, the energy tax, be used to support the Green Bank in its renewable energy and efficiency programs. And earlier this year, uh, in working with the county executive, we expanded the work of the Green Bank, uh, asking them to expand beyond uh, energy, uh, renewable energy, uh, and building efficiency to sustainability. Uh, I'm sorry, to, uh, uh, to, to sustainability as well. And we wanted to make sure that the funding that we put forward in law, uh, that 10% from the fuel tax, uh, the energy tax, Used to, goes directly towards its intention, uh, which is renewable energy and efficiency, and that that did not get diluted by the expansion and scope of the work that the Green Bank will now be undertaking. Uh, and so the T&E Committee recommends enactment uh, of this bill. Ms. Oconee, anything to add? Uh, nothing to add, okay. unless there are questions. Very good. Not seeing any questions. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Council Member Mink? Yes. Council Member Mink votes yes. Council Member Sales? Yes. Council Member Sales votes yes. Council Member Albernaz? Yes. Council Member Albernaz votes yes. Council Member Lutke? Yes. Council Member <laughs> Lutke votes yes. Council Member Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Duwando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. 
Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. So now we're on to the sixth bill. Uh, final reading today, uh, and that is expedited bill 2923, administration, non-merit positions, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Transportation, with accompanying resolutions to adopt Executive Regulation 523 and Executive Regulation 623. Those regulations will be acted upon immediately after legislative session today. But first, I'll turn it over to the chair of the GO committee, which recommends enactment of this bill. Councilmember yeah. Stewart. Um, thank you. Uh, the county exec uh, sent over expedited bill 29-23. This seeks to reclassify two positions in the executive branch from merit to non-merit. The first is the deputy director of environmental protection, and the second was the general manager of transit services in the Department of Transportation. Um, the council um, must concurrently decide whether to adopt the resolutions approving method one regulations that, were, that will be published to create the job descriptions for these positions. Um, uh, I see Ms. Kasiri is here from the county exec's office. She did provide public testimony uh, during the public hearing on it. Uh, the GO committee, when we discussed this, uh, voted three uh, to zero, so unanimously to reclassify the general manager transit services in the Department of Transportation. However, regarding the deputy director of environmental protection, the vote was two to one uh, with Council Vice President Friedson um, opposing the reclassification of that position. Very good. Thank you for that report out. I see Ms. Kasiri, who is here. I'd like to invite her up. Uh, and before I, I uh, open it up for any comments or questions, Ms. Ciccone, anything you'd like to add? Uh, uh, nothing to add except just to point out that the, this, the enactment of the bill and then approval of the resolutions will require seven votes to, uh, to, to pass. Very good. Thank you. Um, uh, I appreciate the thorough conversation that the Government Operations Committee had, and a lot of my questions uh, were asked during that discussion, but, but I think it's important to, to uh, reiterate some of those thoughts now. And so, Ms. Kasiri, why, why change the classification of these two uh, very important positions? Good afternoon, Furiba Kasiri, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer. Um, these, these are the two high-impact, high-level positions um, that we are basically trying to bring in alignment with similar positions we have in many other departments like HHS, police, fire, EHCA, TIPS, and O1B. So these are high-level positions that are um, deeply involved with development and um, implementation of countywide policies or services that impact the quality of life for all in Montgomery County. Um, and finally, we believe this actually will give better opportunity for public to give input, feedback, uh, for any, any, any person that is going to be leading these two positions, and of course, county council's review and approval as well. Um, as far as the budget, the scope of the budget, and the size of the, of the staff, uh, transit division alone has about more than 83 million budget with 870 people, and DOT, DEP has, DEP uh, has 187 million, CIP has 400 million, and 250 employees that are involved, as you well know, many aspects of environment, from solid waste to climate change to water protection. So those are the main reasons. Uh, I, I appreciate uh sharing the perspective of, of the weight of these positions and, and their departments. And in looking at the organizational chart for the county, there are other similar positions in other agencies, right? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the comparisons? Yes. Comparison, um, so we have HHS, our five division chiefs are all appointment, appointed questionnaire, similar. Uh, police, uh, we have actually five additional positions, five assistant chiefs. Fire, we have one. VHCA, we have one. TIPS, we have, I believe, two or three, maybe two, 
OMB, we have one. And in addition, both of these um, DEP and DOT, there are plenty of merit employees. We have 18 in DEP and 12 just in transit division that are either as high as M2 or M3 level. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll say that I, I'm going to support this legislation and the executive uh, and the regulations thereafter. Um, but but uh, two, two different thoughts. Uh, well, one, I will support it as, you know, in my own personal capacity as chair of the Transportation and Environment Committee, and both of these uh, being transportation, one being transportation and one being environment, I think uh, incredibly important to have the right people in the right positions to do the work we know we need to do. Uh, on second thought is uh, I appreciate uh, the thought given to these two positions, the weight of these two positions, uh, but I, I need to publicly remind everybody that we just came out of a very tough budget cycle where we talked about the 1,200 to 1,500 vacancies in county government on any given day. And while we, we the council, did the very hard work of finding savings and efficiencies in that budget to get the proposed tax increase as low as we could, um, I hope that there is continued effort uh, by the executive and his team to continue thinking about our organizational chart and the restructuring that we all know needs to happen. Um, I do not view this as restructuring, uh, but given the thought that has been provided uh, and the idea to do this, we need more. We need more thought to restructuring, restructuring putting the right people in the right positions, um, finding efficiencies, and getting the work done that our residents demand. Uh, again, we are now in five in year five uh, of this county executive and his leadership team, uh, and we still are waiting for some restructuring. But with that, I will support this bill. Council Member Sales. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just had a few questions, um, and thank you for um, your presentation. Um, can you share where the county, where the executive branch is at um, in the process of hiring the individuals for the two positions? Um, we have and we're waiting. John Monger is going to start our new DP directors. He's going to begin. I think his first day is first week of August. So as soon as he's on board, mm -hmm. I am sure we're going to have um, recruitment starting recruiting. And as far as transit, currently other people are acting, and I don't believe we have we have started the recruitment. Oh, okay, I thought um, the two positions, the deputy director and the general manager, were in the process of being hired. You or you're interviewing. Both are vacant. Both yes, are vacant. but you're recruiting for the position, correct? We're not recruiting for positions. Oh, you haven't started. We haven't started the recruitment. Okay, I but we will the, begin. Uh, That's why we want to make it expedited. So we don't have to wait. So as soon as possible, we can start recruiting for these positions. Okay, okay, all right. That's helpful to know. Um, the, uh, I know um, Council Member Friedson mentioned during the uh, GO Committee work session. Um, can you provide more details on the executive's plan to make additional positions non-merit in the near future? At this point, I'm not aware of any positions that we're going to oh, no come up front okay. to, to make it make it from merit to non-merit. Okay. At this point, these are the only positions that I'm aware of that we felt at this point we need to um, come to county council and convert from merit to non-merit. Okay. I just wanted to see if this was going to be a trend and just wanted to see what the county executive, what to expect from the executive moving forward. So it's just these two. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Uh Thank you. Good to see you, Ms. Kasiri. Um, I am going to support the committee's recommendation. I understand where Councilmember Friedson, Council Vice President Friedson, was coming from, but uh, the issue of continuity of service mm -hmm. is particularly critical right now um, because, in part, of those vacant positions that were mentioned earlier. And so giving department heads the flexibility to bring folks on board as quickly as possible 
uh, to maintain operations during what have been unprecedentedly difficult times these last three years, um, I think is really important. So I appreciate um, the comments made by colleagues, and obviously we do want to encourage the administration to continue to think creatively, but not just change for change's sake <laughs> uh, or to check a box, um, but where there truly are efficiencies to be gained um, and taking better advantage of technology as it becomes available. But I'll support this recommendation and uh, appreciate the executive branch's hard work on it. Thank you. Okay, this is a roll call vote. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Council Member Lukey? Yes. Council Member Lukey votes yes. Council Member Mink? Yes. Council Member Mink votes yes. Council Member Sales? Yes. Council Member Sales votes yes. Council Member Albernaz? Yes. Council Member Albernaz votes yes. Council Member Jawando? Yes. Council Member Jawando votes yes. Council Member Katz? Yes. Council Member Katz votes yes. Council Member Stewart? Yes. Council Member Stewart votes yes. Council Member Fana Gonzalez? Yes. Council Member Fana Gonzalez votes yes. Council Member Balcom? Yes. Council Member Balcom votes yes. Council Member Glass? Yes. Council Member Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. That bill passes. Thank you. And our last bill for final reading today is Bill 3023, Streets and Roads, Rustic Roads Advisory Committee. Um, the Transportation and Environment Committee recommends enactment uh, with amendments. Uh, and I will share with colleagues um, that this bill aims to expand the number of members sitting on the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee. Uh, and also changes the membership requirements of that committee. Uh, Bill 3023 uh, had a work session on July 19th, and a number of the hot topic items were that we clarified the committee structure and that it must achieve racial diversity. We expanded the number of members from seven to nine, uh, and also clarified the role that members have, uh, among other things. And I know there are other things, so I will turn it over to Ms. Nadu to articulate them. Hi, good afternoon, council members. So I'm going to go through each of the committee recommendations. They start on page four of your staff report, which I believe you all have a copy in front of you. So the very first one is the intent of this uh, bill was to increase representation on the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee. So the first committee recommendation is very close to the beginning of the bill. It says in making appointments, the executive should strive to achieve diversity. And the committee here unanimously recommended changing the word should to must. Uh, next up, the bill did not make any changes to the existing requirement that farmers earn 50% more, 50 or more of their income from farming. But the AAC, oh sorry, acronyms again, the Agricultural <laughs> Advisory Committee um, did request adding the phrase direct involvement in commodity farming. The intent here is the uh, commodity farmers are the ones who tend to own the really large equipment and so have a lot of concerns about the rustic roads. The committee recommendation here was two to one with Councilmember Stewart dissenting, um, agreeing with AAC's recommendation to add that language. As noted during the committee work session, there's not currently a definition for commodity farmer in the county code. Uh, so I, council staff, worked with the Office of Agriculture as well as planning uh, to come up with the definition, which you will see uh, about in the middle of page five. And a commodity farmer will be defined as a person engaged in the production of at least 100 acres of field crops, such as corn, soybeans, barley, and wheat or forage crops such as hay, requiring the use of large commercial equipment for planting, nutrient application, pest management, and harvesting. And the committee has since agreed um, with that definition as well. Uh, next in the bill, a uh, major part of the bill, in fact, was adding three at-large members um, and in exchange taking away the two civic association members. The council received a lot of testimony and correspondence um, because with this language was a list of examples. Um, planning had noted that the examples were to be illustrative and show the type of people um, that they were thinking of to be these at-large members. Um, but the committee unanimously re recommended removing 
the examples themselves. But because one of the concerns that we've heard from various agricultural groups is that we do want to make sure we're including farmers who aren't necessarily commodity farmers, is including a table crop farmer or agritourism business. So the AAC's recommendation was to do two at-large members and then one table crop or agritourism uh, member. Instead, the committee uh, recommended including language that just says we'll have three at-large members but the executive should strive to make sure that at least one of them is a table crop farmer or in the agritourism business. Um, as noted during the committee by Chair Glass, um, we do have some trouble getting people for these committees. And as noted um, in the staff report, there's only about 35 of those large commodity farmers and maybe 100, 150 of the smaller farmers. And given that there's already four different committees from that community, making sure we're not limiting the number of people we can get. So that was the intent behind that recommendation. I'm going to, oh, sorry, the one last part is changing um, users of rustic roads to frequent users of rustic roads, especially since those examples are coming out. Um, and then lastly, council staff had recommended clarifying that the at-large members should not duplicate any of the other members who are already there, just to make sure that this is really gonna be a representative group. Um, here I will pause because Councilmember Balcom actually changed her vote afterwards and I will let you explain it, unless you'd like me to. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Balcom. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of discussion at, uh, and thank you all for the, the t and &E committee was a very robust, a uh, lot of changes, a lot of moving parts. Um, and so there was a lot of discussion about the table crop farmers and um, the uh, the intent was that um, there were a lot of um, comments to include table crop farmers. Subsequent to the vote, there was discussion with some of the um, uh, the stakeholders that the request for a table crop farmer was not in addition to the commodity farmers, but instead of a commodity farmer. And, um, and the request was to have uh, the three at-large members not have any restriction whatsoever. Um, and so that uh, seems reasonable and fair. So I would like to propose that uh, we change the language uh, just, uh, and it's here on um, page seven, um, the, so the three at-large members who do not satisfy the requirements of the subsection uh, one through five above um, to, uh, to be drawn from um, other frequent users of rustic roads and delete the preference um, given to a tabletop farmer. And that way there's no restriction to the at-large and there's no expectation of who those at-large um, members should be. Okay, there is a motion by Council Member Balcom to Second. amend the definition of the three at-large members. Second. Seconded by Council Member Albernaz. Council Member Stewart. No, I was just gonna say thank you to Council Member Balcom for clarifying that it was, there was a lot of moving pieces um, while we were talking about this on the T&E committee and I will support that change as well, thank you. Very good, uh, I will support that change as well. Uh, all those who are in support of that change, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Ms. McDo? Okay, so then the last thing that the bill did in addition to clarifying the members is clarifying the duties. So there were originally three, yes, three additional duties that were added to the list of duties that already existed for the RRAC. Uh, we did receive a lot of testimony requesting that the RRAC already does a lot of work and they're already under a lot of time pressure, um, but it is true that all the duties that were added in this list are actually ones that they already have. Um, one of them was a requirement that's in the subdivision code, and the other two were in executive regulations. But in going through each one, the committee unanimously decided that instead of specifically saying what the two executive regulation duties are to keep it more general. So as written here on page seven, to just say other duties as required by executive regulations, you'll be going through the master plan later this afternoon and hearing that new regulations are coming over. So by making it more general, we won't have to amend the bill again after we get new regs. 
appreciate you uh, sharing, uh, explaining it the way you did. You know, with the 90, more than 90 boards, committees, and commissions that we have here, they all are expected to provide uh, their thoughts and uh, guidance. And sometimes when it is uh, enumerated and written out for us, it might seem daunting, uh, but it is no different than any of the other boards, committees, and commissions. Uh, so uh, that, no decision point there. So the last remaining decision point is one that was not actually addressed um, at committee, but there was a letter that Councilmember Lukey had sent um, that had three different recommendations. The committee had actually taken up two of them, but there was a third one um, asking for language um, from DOT on maintenance requests on rustic roads, because again, as you'll hear in the master plan report later, we get a lot um, of complaints about maintenance on these roads. Um, and so this was also not a committee recommendation, but uh, Councilmember Lukey's suggestion, and the letter is also included in your staff report. Okay. Councilmember Lukey. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, this is something that, you know, regardless of whether you're a resident back there or you're a farmer back there or you're just a user <laughs> of those roads, the maintenance of them is critically important for safety, um, for making sure that the farm equipment is movable in without damage to the equipment or without injury to to those using the equipment um, and you know like it or not and and I live off of one of these it they're out of sight item out of mind sometimes so I think it's important to note what the level of uh, concerns are related to safety on those roads and I don't think it should be too significant of a number to be able to report to the council um, so that we have a better sense of the scope of what it takes as a county government to, to keep things going and to make sure we're being proactive rather than reactive. So that's the point of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes review. So you would need a motion um, for that amendment, but uh, other right. than that, I am done. Right. Uh, so we have a piece of legislation uh, before us that has been amended. Uh, is there a motion to move this bill? So moved. Uh, moved by Councilmember Balcom. Second. Seconded by Councilmember <laughs> Stewart. Uh, this is a roll call vote. Councilmember Lucy? Yes. Councilmember Lucy votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. So the bill to update the Rustic Road Advisory Committee is approved. Thank you. Thank you to the Planning Department as well for your work on that. And Everybody in the audience, yes, thank you to our farmers, our agricultural community as well, um, and our residents who are here. <laughs> um, so we have a few more things, I, planning, you might want to just stay there if you want. We'll go through the other regulations before we come back to the planning. So as noted earlier, uh, there are two executive regulations associated with uh, Bill 2923, which we just enacted, uh, and these regulations require action. So the first is Executive Regulation 523, Non-Merit Position Deputy Director, Department of Environmental Protection. I'll turn it over to GO Committee, Councilmember Stewart. Oh, we really have nothing to add on this. We've discussed it, and we recommend moving it forward. Thank there we you. go. And we unanimously supported the underlying legislation. Uh, uh, and so this is just a hand vote. So all those in favor of Executive Regulation 523, that's unanimous. And the second executive regulation is Executive Regulation 623, Non-Merit Position Deputy Director, General Manager of Transit Services for the Department of Transportation. Chair Stewart. Same. We recommend moving this forward. There you go. Um, all those in favor of this executive regulation? Uh, that is nine. All those opposed? We, 
Were you going? Oh, that's it. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, one more, one more time. All those in favor? There you go. That's unanimous. Okay. She'd already moved on. She'd moved on. Uh, okay. So, uh, we are now going to return to district council to discuss the Rustic Roads Master Plan. Uh, and the Transportation and Environment Committee discussed this on July 19th. And we're going to continue that conversation now. Um, it's important to note that the first comprehensive update to the Rustic Roads Master Plan, uh, this is the first one since 1996. And times have changed a bit, uh, but many of these roads still uh, maintain their historic beauty uh, and historic nature and this program is just really designed to honor the historic nature of these scenic roadways and reflect on the agricultural character and rural origin of so many parts of our county and so when the t and &E committee took this up we had a number of discussions about roadway classifications and maintenance uh, and ultimately uh, agreed to uh, support an amended plan that reclassifies uh, several roads uh, and recommended that over uh, the next few budget cycles uh, we review the rustic roads met by method two executive regulation uh, in consultation with the planning staff uh, and the and the newly now newly constituted rustic roads uh, advisory committee and uh, we support this uh, by a vote of three to zero. Uh, and I will turn it over to Dr. Orland, if there's anything I left out. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first thing I want to mention is this is both a work session and an action section session on this plan. So hopefully, uh, if you do make recommendations that are different than what the t &E committee made, you're on record, and then take action on the entire plan. So we'll be done before going to recess. Um, most of what this plan does that's actionable has to do with the classification of roads. Uh, what roads become exceptional or rustic roads that are not now, what ones are declassified as exceptional rustic, which ones are changed from exceptional to rustic or rustic exceptional, what pieces get changed from one, one to another, that sort of thing. And it's important because uh, the regulations that um, apply uh, to rustic and exceptional rustic roads to varying degrees uh, limit the amount of work that can be done on construction or maintenance. Uh, exceptional rustic roads uh, uh, being the highest bar in terms of uh, not making changes. In that respect, it's like an historic preservation program. Um, I'll just cover those items which uh, was ra were raised in the public hearing and which the committee took votes on. Uh, but uh, most of this plan, uh, the committee entirely agrees with um, uh, what the planning board recommended. And I made the comment during the committee session, I'll say it again, this is one of the best looking plans and best put together plans I've ever seen. I've been around here like 33 years, so um, just to say that aside. So kudos to everybody involved with this. Um, the first item um, is on page three of the packet, Bachelors Forest Road. Uh, currently, it's a rustic road from Georgia Avenue to um, Route 108 in the Albany area. Uh, the planning board recommends uh, declassifying uh, it as a rustic road for the first 1,200 feet east of Georgia Avenue, uh, where it goes by a church and goes by the cemetery. Uh, and it's not particularly rustic in that location. There's more volume is there as well. Uh, DOT had raised the point that perhaps there should be other sections of Bachelors Forest that's looked at as, as possible declassification. Uh, but the committee talked about it and they, and they unanimously recommended not uh, basically agreeing with the planning board, just declassifying that first 1,200 feet and classifying that section as a country road. Um, I'll just keep going unless there's folks who want to jump in. Uh, the next is Frederick Road, just Route 355 uh, in Hyattstown from Route 109. It's the road that comes up from uh, Poolsville uh, up to the county line. Uh, it has been classified as a rustic road. Uh, however, uh, my recommendation here was to declassify it, making it a country road. It doesn't go through a rustic area. It is literally an historic district. Uh, the historic district really controls uh, what can happen along that road anyway. It's not likely to have any changes. And so the uh, committee, committee agreed with my recommendation to uh, declassify that as a rustic road and classify it as a, 
uh, as a country connector, which is the same classification as Route 55 south of there to, towards Clarksburg. Um, the next two roads are um, both in the Sandy Spring area, uh, Meeting House Road and Bentley Road. Uh, Meeting House Road runs south of Route 108 to the uh, Meeting the uh, 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 the Meeting House and beyond. Um, and uh, DOT had raised the point that uh, is an exceptional rustic road now. DOT had raised the point that the first 300 feet or so of it is really through more of a commercial area and not particularly rustic. Uh, and there's also more uh, local traffic going in that first section of it. And so um, the recommendation was to declassify just the first 300 or so feet of that uh, and make it a country road and that the rest of it remain as an exceptional rustic road. Uh, the committee agreed with that. And similarly, uh, in the same area, Bentley Road, which runs north of 108, um, which uh, immediately serves the Sandy Spring Museum and then goes beyond that. That is a rustic road, and the recommendation from DOT is that the first piece of it from 108 up to um, the Sandy Spring Museum entrance be classified as a country road, but the bulk of it, the rest of it, remain as a rustic road. And the committee agreed with that unanimously. Uh, the next road is uh, Halsey Road. Halsey Road is a uh, uh, about a two-thirds of a mile long uh, road, it dead ends. Um, uh, after going about two-thirds of a mile, it, it's north of Damascus, it's between Damascus and Claggettsville, uh, and it runs east of Route 27. Um, at the intersection of Claggetts, of uh, one, of, sorry, Maryland 27 and uh, Halsey Road is the uh, historic African-American community of Friendship, um, and in the first two-tenths of a mile of that uh, two-thirds of a mile road, uh, it's not particularly rustic. It is a, um, uh, there's an industrial facility there, uh, business industrial facility and several houses fairly close together. Um, the planning board had recommended designated as a rustic road. It's not one now. Uh, the uh, member of the community came out and said this is a, a community which would like to see sidewalks, would like to see street lights in the area where there are, uh, where there are homes um, and, and basically recommended against it being a, a rustic road. Uh, the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee had originally recommended it being a rustic road, and then they later wrote uh, in, in response saying, no, it shouldn't be a rustic road, they, in deference to the local um, sentiment there about the wish for sidewalks and, and street lights, and also recognizing the uh, historic African-American uh, community in that neighborhood. Um, I had recommended a compromise, basically, which would have that first 1,200 feet uh, or 1,000 feet or so be uh, remain as a country road, as, as speaking, not being rustic. And if you look at page, I don't know if you have it with you, but page 156 of volume two, which has the, uh, the map of Halsey Road and where the significant features are, all the significant features are east of that first thousand feet. So my recommendation had been to uh, classify the first thousand feet or so as being country road, but to have the bulk of it beyond that point be a rustic. Uh, Committee, however, considered all that and decided, and unanimously recommended that the entire road be a, um, uh, uh, a country road and not be classified as a uh, uh, as a rustic road. Um, moving on, uh, Awkward Lane uh, is a road that the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee had recommended being a rustic road. The Planning Board did not recommend it. Awkward Lane is a street that runs off of uh, Good Hope Road. Um, which is a rustic road, um, and they point out the there's again it's an historic African American community along that area. Uh, however, the planning board did not recommend it uh, because it did not meet one of the criteria uh, in the criterion in the law for a rustic road, uh, which is that it's located um, uh, in an area where natural, agricultural, or historic features are predominant, and this is the key point, and where master plan land use goals and zoning are compatible with rustic or rural nature. Um, and it clearly is not. If anyone's going down that road, you see there are basically houses all along it. Uh, it's not particularly, it, it's a narrow road, but it's not a rustic um, uh, uh, environment, and the zoning there is not for, uh, for and it's not rural zoning or anything mm -hmm. necessarily compatible with, uh, with rural area. Um, so the committee recommended concurring with the planning board not having it be a, um, a rustic road. Uh, Elton Farm Road uh, was raised at the meeting. Um, uh, yep, uh, Councilmember Mink. Oh, sorry. No, no problem. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you for that. I wanted to, I, I know we've had a couple conversations about Awkward Lane, and of course we've heard from um, uh, our seat from the advisory committee, and uh, my office has also continued to hear from some residents about this. Oh, I just lost my screen again. I don't know. Um, thanks. Oh, oh, it came back. Okay. I'm not going to touch anything. I'm not going to breathe. So, yeah, so the, um, uh, so Awkward Lane was um, nominated for RESA designation, received support from the advisory committee, and, and then the, but the recommendation has, has proceeded, as, as mentioned, to not, uh, to not go move forward with that. What are the master plan recommendations and zoning along Awkward Lane? It's a... It's Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Jamie Pratt, uh, one of the uh, co-leads on the master plan. Um, my recollection, I always have to look at maps for this, but it's the R200 zone. Um, and, you know, the lots that exist there are reflective of that. There's not any agricultural activity that I could detect until you get to the very end of the road. There might be something that looks more like an old farm, but it's past the end of the public road and that you have to be part of the public road to be a rustic road. So at the very point where it goes down to this two lane, almost dirt track, it's no longer eligible for the program. So the part that is public uh, does not have those characteristics that we would expect. In the, and there's no land use recommendations other than the, the residential small lot development that exists. Thank you. Um, could you also respond to the advisory committee's comparison with Nicholson Farm Road in Dickerson? Um, it's probably a fair comparison. I think that Dickerson Farm Road has, um, it's um, more surrounded by uh, the countryside and it was part of a more um, historic alignment, I believe, of, um, I'm getting my road names mixed up here, but Oh yeah, I have, I have a map here. So um, 28 used to run up uh, that alignment, um, but it is, I mean, I would say Nicholson Farm Road is probably one of the most residential roads that is still recommended as rustic in the program. There's maybe a couple more that are somewhere in between residential and you know suburban residential and a more rural residential look um, so they are similar um, I think that Nicholson Farm just has a more visually pleasing uh, feel to it as you drive down that road so I just wanted I just wanted to to note and amplify some of the uh, you know some of what we've been hearing from residents as well as from the advisory committee that we have here a very similar situation um, and there's also the fact that this is uh, is a historic African American uh, community in the Cloverly area. We have many descendants of the original settlers who have you know lived there uh, for over 140 years. Um, and so you know I, I think that it it deserves some some extra consideration. I don't know if there's any conversation that folks are interested in having. Um, I also would note while we have our friends from planning here. Uh, as a related question, perhaps, um, but possibly more important than the rustic road designation um, could be some real visible recognition um, with signage um, of Holly Grove as a historic African American community. Um, but I just want to make sure that we are, uh, you know, doing our part to recognize the significance of the area. If you could speak to that. Sure, and I can I can uh, help to address that. Tanya Stern, acting planning director. Uh, Council Member Meek, what you just noted, there actually was quite a bit of discussion both with the t &E committee as well as with right. the planning board on this, mm -hmm. on this um, nomination. And uh, where we landed, you know, as staff noted, was that uh, this road did not meet the criteria for a rustic road. However, uh, given the history of that community, that there are other ways to acknowledge and to celebrate that, that history, whether it's through um, some other means through uh, historic markers or things of that nature. And so that was, you know, that was where we landed with that, was that there are, there are some other means in which we can definitely acknowledge that history. 
um, but it's not dependent upon a rustic road designation. I think that that is fair, and uh, and I appreciate the thought and consideration that has been given to this by um, both all of you um, who have been working on this at planning, um, and by the T&E committee, and uh, and I look forward to supporting and hopefully moving forward, uh, you know, some of the ideas that you just mentioned. I think that is is uh, really important to the community there as well as to us as a county to make sure we are you know taking that tangible action. Thank you. I, I appreciate those the comments, uh, Councilmember Mink and. You know, there, while there are currently 99 rustic roads, that does not mean there are only 99 historic roads in our community. Uh, and uh, history can be preserved and celebrated in many different ways, as you just noted, and we can continue that work. Uh, and I know that work has been going on. Uh, and so thank you, thank you for elevating it. And then uh, before I turn it over to Councilmember Sales, I will say if people have not checked out this document and if you do not have the opportunity to pick one up uh, physically and you find it online um, it is a beautiful document and if you want to check out and visit any of these rustic roads this is the roadmap literally to get you there and uh, to help orient you so uh, kudos to the planning department for for putting this together councilmember sales uh, thank you mr. president um, just wanted uh, just wanted to ask a question um, just to get a better understanding to follow up on Councilmember Mink's um, question about the designation of the rustic roads versus a historical marker. Um, it's, you know, as we mentioned, it's, as your um, colleague mentioned, it's pretty similar to the other roads. So I'm just wondering what the differences are that make it not qualify for rustic road designation. Yeah, for the record, Patrick Bellard, uh, it's hard without a visual now that, now that we're is. sitting here. It, but It um, would be helpful if the Planning Commission is going to be referencing any roads or any maps that we have visuals. Well, no, 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 yeah, but so it should be yeah. here on the screen, not for us to right. yeah as right. we're talking right so I'll try to uh, verbally paint a picture for you but okay. um, there are several improvements that are uh, suburban in nature uh, along that particular road uh, several different uh, styles of uh, fences driveways um, other various structures that are very close to the road and so when we were uh, analyzing this road it looked and felt very much like a suburban community, not one that is sort of rustic in nature and meeting the criteria uh, that, again, the uh, uh, staff person, uh, Dr. Glenn Orlin, was uh, uh, describing. So just from that standpoint alone, uh, we did wrestle with this uh, uh, quite a bit because of the historic nature uh, of the community along the road. But when applying the criteria, we felt that it didn't meet the criteria, but did merit some type of um, designation and so again I'll point to the recommendation on the top of page 66 to instead of designating this road as a rustic road to memorialize the historic Holly Grove community with the historic marker and then there is a paragraph about uh, the community itself so we did again go through this uh, quite extensively both with staff the rustic roads advisory committee uh, the planning board uh, and then at the the t &E committee work session but ultimately, that was our that was our recommendation, and okay. that we put forward for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Orland. Okay, the next uh, road on page five is Elton Farm Road. Uh, Elton Farm Road is uh, classified uh, is, is is recommending. Uh, it, it is actually an exceptional rustic road. Now, uh, the first part of it is paved. The back part of it is not. Uh, one of the pieces of uh, testimony received at the public hearing was from a resident who lives along the, uh, the back part of the road, Mr. Eisenstadt, who pointed out that several times over the course of any year uh, there are washouts of that road and the DOT has to come in and regrade it. Uh, and they've been very prompt in doing that, but nevertheless it's, you know, it's costly, it's a bit of a hassle. Um, uh, and Ms. Uh, uh, Balcom's recommendation, uh, the committee agreed to reclassify this as a reg, uh, call, I'll call it a regular rustic road as opposed to an exceptional rustic road. 
which will leave open the opportunity uh, for uh, it to be um, uh, basically torrent chipped uh, as opposed to just remain as a gravel road of the entire length. The committee unanimously agreed with that. Uh, and it also means amending the significant features to, um, uh, I guess, recognize that there is a gravel section now, but it isn't necessarily always going to be gravel. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next item isn't a particular road. It's uh, a, a recommendation or a, a point made by DOT having to do with bridges on several uh, exceptional rustic roads, uh, which they point out are either bridges which are uh, either not very old or not particularly significant architecturally. Uh, and they're recommending going back and looking at those to see whether or not they really are significant features. Uh, and the, the, the point here is that if it were not a significant feature, then it might leave open the opportunity uh, for the bridge to be widened. Um, the regulations currently, even for exceptional rustic roads, says that um, if it's needed for agricultural equipment passage, that a, a narrow bridge can be widened, even under the exceptional rustic road classification, uh, as long as it's no wider than the approach road itself. Uh, and so that ability exists. Um, so if you're talking about a situation where you have a narrow two-lane road, but it approaches a one-lane bridge, uh, even if it's an exceptional road, it could be widened to a two-lane bridge, as long as that bridge is no wider than the approaches. Um, and this comes into play not very often, but now and then, every few years. Uh, there is a bridge uh, on an exceptional rustic road where uh, maybe it needs to be replaced for functional reasons. And uh, there is the ability uh, in many circumstances to use federal aid to pay for a large portion of it. Uh, but uh, federal aid will not allow, uh, it's not allowed to be used on a road, uh, on a bridge replacement, which is takes a one lane bridge and keeps it as a one lane bridge. Nevertheless, in the past, the council has decided to essentially swallow that um, and say, look, no, we're going to keep it as a one-lane bridge. Uh, this is what happened on White Brown Road uh, south of Boyd several years ago. Uh, it's an exceptional rustic road, which uh, the DOT had recommended widening to a sort of standard two-lane width. The, the council said, no, it's, it's an rust exceptional rustic road. We'll pay the full freight for that, uh, keeping that as a one-lane bridge, but bringing it up to date with a, you know, a, a, a bridge that's functionally, uh, structurally sound, which is what they did. Um, and frankly, federal aid is pretty uh, fungible. It, there are lots of roads, lots of bridges that the DOT could use for that money. So instead of using it for white ground, it was used for uh, another road. So the bottom line is the uh, committee uh, recommend concurring with the planning board staff to keep all of those bridges as uh, significant features uh, in the plan. Uh, the next item, the top of page six, is actually a pretty minor point. Uh, DOT had pointed out that the road and lane widths in the plan uh, are specified what they are, but uh, that those aren't necessarily the widths of the road. Sometimes uh, the edges of the road are covered with, um, with vegetation, and it's hard to really see how what the width is. And so uh, they recommended uh, adding the word tentative and what the committee ended up on was calling them approximate widths. So in the plan, in the resolution that you see in the packet, uh, it refers to them as approximate widths. Um, and then there's actually one other change I want to skip ahead a little bit on page seven, which has to do with uh, recommendations for revised language for the executive reg. Um, and we will, as part of the recommendations to the committee, we're asking DOT to go back, working with stakeholders, come back with a, a comprehensive revision to the executive reg for rustic roads uh, by next year, by 2024. Uh, it hasn't been updated, just like this plan has been updated since 1996. The executive reg has not been updated since 1996. So uh, the, the committee recommended that it have a fresh, that way everyone have a fresh look at this. But one of the uh, uh, items in the plan was to suggest some language that might go into the uh, executive reg. Uh, and uh, it shows up here on page seven of the packet. It says a rustic or exceptional rustic road will receive the level of maintenance as necessary to ensure its continued viability as a transportation facility and to allow for safe travel by all users of the road. And at Ms. Balcom's uh, recommendation, add this, the point, and by agricultural equipment in particular. And the committee agreed with that. Uh, I do want to point out that in the resolution that I've attached to this packet, somehow that one got left out. I apologize for that. It was my fault. 
Uh, and so if you approve this resolution as T rec recommended it, we need to add that to the, uh, to the resolution. Um, so there's that. And then uh, going back, bottom page six, top page seven, I think I've already refer referred to, the committee is recommending, this is already not part of the plan, but separate from the plan, is to have this ex a comprehensive uh, update to the executive reg be done by 2024. Dr. Orlan, just to clarify what you just said, uh, the recommendation had been made by Councilmember Balcom to uh, specifically state that agricultural equipment in particular, and you said it was not in one of the packets, but, but it was approved. It's in the packet, but it's not in the resolution. That's it, okay. Just I'm clarifying yeah. Yeah, yeah. where it was missing, but the intention was there. Yes. Yeah, it, 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 if, you, if you really look cl closely at the resolution, there should be an entry on page 53, uh, which would add this language, and it's not there. Great, I thank you. I left it out. Didn't mean to. Um, and then finally, in terms of um, uh, follow-up recommendations having to do with maintenance, uh, the committee felt pretty strongly that they wanted to see more maintenance done on these, uh, on actually rural roads in general, not just rustic roads and exceptional rustic roads, but other rural roads, particularly where in situations where farm equipment is having a difficult time, whether it's uh, overhead. Um, canopy being too low, or ditches not being cleared out, or culverts not being cleared out, or um, resurfacing, whatever. So three recommendations here, which the committee unanimously agreed with, that starting in the next CIP, the 25 to 30 CIP, we take a current PDF, which is resurfacing, uh, this is a capital project, uh, resurfacing residential and rural roads, and split it into two different PDFs, one for residential, one for rural, so you can really track how much money is being spent on resurfacing on rural roads. And, and this is consistent with our policy, particularly in some of our down, uh, our, our central business districts with, with regards to the BIPAs, making sure that while we have funding that goes towards bicycle and pedestrian improvement, uh, we further wanted to, uh, uh, we wanted everyone to be able to see where those funds were going directly to which CBDs or, or areas, and this would do the same between rural roads and residential roads. Right. Um, and then a similar PDF uh, that exists today, uh, the Residential Road Rehabilitation PDF, which is the major reconstruction of roads when the roads are really failing, uh, to split that also into two different PDFs, one for residential, one for rural. And then finally, in the operating budget, um, this may be more difficult bureaucratic task to do, but the committee felt strongly it should be undertaken, uh, is to try to separate out in the program budget uh, from DOT on highway services the amount of money budgeted for uh, general maintenance, you know, op uh, annual maintenance on rural roads separate from other roads. Um, and so uh, all three of those recommendations are ones that the committees unanimously agreed to. They're not literally, again, part of the plan, but it's follow-up uh, from the discussion that ensued from that. And uh, I believe that's it. Very good. Well, there is a Transportation and Environment Committee uh, recommendation uh, to support this, and I see Councilmember Stewart has some comments. I just wanted to raise one other point that we discussed at the T&E Committee, understanding that Department of Transportation talked about the their limited budgets, and we all agreed on the need for maintenance. Um, and um, I request that DOT work with our Department of Environmental Protection and look at given um, the rustic roads and the need for stormwater, culverts, and other things, that there could be some climate change resilience um, funding or work that um, could be done. Um, and that just wasn't reflected in the packet, so I just wanted to say it in full council. So um, hopefully uh, we can look for potentially other sources of funding um, for some of the maintenance issues. Just wanted to raise that. It might not be in the packet, but it will be its own t &E committee session. So you got that. Uh, Councilmember Ludke. Thank you. Um, yes, I want to thank the TNU committee for all the hard work you put into this. This is this is a beast, um, and I appreciate that. And and you all are tired of me raising maintenance issues. I know that. But um, in addition to the points that Councilmember Stewart just made, I think it's important in looking at anything through the resiliency lens that we also include the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security um, in your assessments because they're the ones who have to respond when there has been a catastrophic weather event or other uh, challenging situation. Um, so resiliency planning in that respect falls under OEM. Um, and 
I, I'm, I'm hoping there is some kind of document that can come to us that shows the costs associated with this projected um, or real, uh, you know, maybe what has been spent over the past five years, for example, to respond to and go back and take care of things. When we had the public hearings, um, we had testimony from a gentleman who lived on a on one of these roads that was gravel and lived up a hill. And so every time there was a bad rain, you know, folks would have to come out from, from DOT to, to fix it and help him. And they, he did, he commended the efforts and the response, but that's also, maybe that's not the best way to go about it is make, you know, that we have to respond to a critical situation every time there's a heavy thunderstorm because heaven knows just this summer, we've had quite a few. Um, so what I'm looking for is for DOT to come back to us and provide us with some information and statistics that shows the costs to handling this year in and year out. Um, not because I don't love rustic roads, I do, but I want to make sure we're responding to maintaining and preserving them in, with 21st century technologies and methods and responsive to 21st century environmental and climate change. So thank you. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Again, there is a T&E uh, recommendation for approval of this Ruster, Rustic Roads uh, Master Plan. I again want to thank our, our incredible planning staff for the great work you did and, and give another PSA for residents to take a look at the document, uh, check out uh, any number of these Rustic Roads and go visit them uh, because they are beautiful and we're going to keep them beautiful. Uh, and with that, we have a recommendation. All those in favor of the T&D recommendation for the Rustic Roads Master Plan, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Balcom. Um, so thank you, thank you all. I know that um, it, we've had a lot of questions and a lot of back and forth, so I want to I want to thank the planning staff and certainly uh, Dr. Orland for for his work. I want to thank the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee for for their work and engagement and to the farmers, thank you for all the work that, not only that you've done on the master plan, but for all the work that you do um, every day on your farms. So I appreciate that. I, I also want to uh, make two, two comments. We, we now have seven districts. Five of those districts have rustic roads. Uh, um, Councilmember Katz has one, but it's, a, <laughs> but it's a great one. So we have five of the seven districts with rustic roads. Um, and I also just want to state that um, there has been a lot of discussion and a lot of passionate discourse on the uh, Rustic Roads Advisory Committee. I appreciate that. I appreciate all the, the texts, the phone calls, the, the emails. But I don't want to, to get lost that by unanimous vote, this council um, uh, is committed to this Rustic Roads program. And um, there, there is unwavering support to make sure that our Rustic Roads uh, stay as they are and stay a very important part of our agricultural uh, reserve and a very important part of our community. So I appreciate all the effort that's been done and um, I appreciate the unanimous vote for this master plan. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Very quickly, uh, when I was on the planning board, we had to deal with the uh, rustic roads, and I am so glad I'm not in the TNE &E committee. <laughs> so thank you, Council <laughs> President Glass, for not doing that to me. Um, this is uh, very, um, I speak my mind, as you can see. Um, I just wanted to also to highlight that uh, the Economic Development Committee will have a session on agro-tourism on November 6th, and that session is going to be at County, so stay tuned. We would love to see our farmers there because this issue has everything to do with economic development. So stay tuned. Thank you. November 6th. Uh, thank you. Again, thank you to everybody. Thank you to our, our ag community, our farmers. Thank you to our residents, uh, and let's go visit those roads soon. So thank you. We have one more item on our agenda going from roads to sewers. We are going to have a work session and hopefully action regarding 
approval of a letter in response to the Maryland Department of the Environment requesting reconsideration of several uh, disapproval comments uh, regarding Montgomery County's 10-year comprehensive water supply and sewer systems plan from 2022 to 2031 and related disapproved category changes. Um, you know, for context, I will share that last year the previous council uh, approved a comprehensive water supply and sewer plan that had some uh, changes and recommendations made to it uh, and the state uh, rejected a number of those recommendations, things that uh, we as a council and as a community uh, wanted. And so after uh, a number of months of back and forth, uh, there is a shot clock in which we need to uh, reply and once again make our argument on behalf of our residents and members of our business community uh, so that they could have uh, appropriate and adequate uh, uh, sewer hookup. And so with that, I, I will save all the details for Mr. Lovchenko to tick through, um, but that is the context <coughs> and the Teen E Committee uh, unanimously uh, supported uh, a letter, writing a letter to Maryland Department of Environment uh, requesting reconsideration of these, these properties and their status. Mr. Lovchenko. Yeah, and just for some context, the MDE did approve a new 10-year water and sewer plan for the county based on what the council, the council had approved last October. What we're talking about are those elements that were disapproved. So overwhelmingly, they approved most of the plan. I don't want right. to make it look like they threw the plan out. Of, uh, threw the plan out. Correct. Um, but there were a couple of important policies in there that the council had spent a lot of time on and that uh, 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 we felt were important to bring back to the t and &E committee for discussion. Uh, to see if there was an interest in reconsideration, and the committee met on June 29th uh, and discussed uh, a couple, uh, several policies in particular, uh, which I can summarize now. Uh, and those uh, uh, two of the policies discussed did make it into the draft letter that, based on the committee's discussion in June, that's attached to the packet. Um, based on the conclusion of this session, if the if the council is supportive of sending a draft letter. We will finalize that draft letter and, and send it out into the council president's signature uh, to meet that six-month deadline that uh, Mr. Glass mentioned. Um, the, the two policies in particular, uh, one had to do with the abutting mains policy. Uh, this is a pretty, uh, it, it's a long-standing policy in the 10-year plan. Uh, last fall, the council had approved new language to allow under uh, cer cer uh, certain circumstances for uh, properties that are um, adjacent to each other and under common ownership to transfer their abutting mains rights from one property to another under very certain conditions. Um, uh, the state was concerned about the implications of that uh, and recommended denial of that particular language. Uh, however, in the draft letter, we try to make clear uh, that in fact this language puts some guardrails up uh, that do not exist currently uh, when we have properties in that situation uh, that could resubdivide, and through the resubdivision process, they could effectively transfer those abutting mains rights without some of these guardrails. Uh, so, uh, while it provides an opportunity within the 10-year plan uh, for a transfer that was not other otherwise explicitly noted, uh, it actually is providing some more um, boundaries, if you will, from what could be done under the subdivision process. Um, so, that's the crux of the argument we're making. Uh, in the draft letter is that this provides a little more structure uh, to that and allows under very, very restrictive conditions for that to occur. We, we took a look at properties in the county that might be eligible and there are very, very few, uh, including one of the properties that was deferred, one of the requests that was deferred that was the impetus for the look at this, uh, the inane property, um, uh, which fell into this category and was one where the council was sympathetic to the issue. Um, so that one and perhaps one or two others in the county might fall into this category. Uh, of course, properties change ownership, so that, you know, that issue could change over time. Uh, but one of the key factors in, this, in the conditions is that the donor property, if you will, uh, must have a fully functioning septic system that meets all current requirements and also have uh, reserve areas for um, future septic field replacement. Uh, so under those conditions, it would be very rare for 
the donor property in the future to see a failure that would have to be addressed. And if it was, it could very easily be addressed, hopefully, on site. Uh, so it would not open up uh, service to more properties than were intended in that area. Um, so that's the first policy that we're recommending reconsideration from the state on that's noted in the draft letter. Without objection. Uh, the second one has to do with what we call the commercial sewer service policy. Uh, this is a policy that the council was um, uh, had a lot of discussion with uh, last fall and asked council staff to uh, draft a, uh, uh, a policy with conditions that would allow for uh, commercial properties that are outside the planned sewer service envelope, once again under certain conditions, uh, to be eligible uh, to connect to sewer. Uh, the intent there was to allow some flexibility for commercial properties to make improvements to their properties to better serve the surrounding community. Um, this was done, uh, if you recall, uh, Mr. Glass, at the same time that Thrive 2050 was working its way through the council. And there's discussion about 15-minute living and uh, complete communities. And in that context, uh, the council saw providing some additional flexibility for these commercial villages uh, to have some uh, ability to um, uh, renovate, expand, uh, revise some of their uses on site on a case-by-case -case basis under certain conditions. Uh, this was seen as being something supportive of that. Uh, uh, the particular properties uh, that spurred this discussion were the TransQuest LLC property, also known as the old White House property, and the Travilla Oak LLC property. Both properties are located at the intersection of Glen uh, Road and Travilla Road in Potomac. Bo uh, the Travilla Oak property is, is a what you would call a, a commercial village now, and they were looking to um, provide enhancements on that property. And the old White House property was looking at converting the historic property into an inn. Uh, and uh, both the planning board, uh, when it transmitted its recommendations, and the council were sympathetic uh, to what the property owners wanted to do, uh, but there was no policy in the 10-year plan nor uh, uh, exceptional policy in the, in the uh, master plan to allow for that uh, kind of exception. Uh, so that's why the council asked staff to come up with that exception. Uh, once again, MDE was concerned about the potential implications of that, uh, so in the draft letter, uh, we've reiterated the um, uh, conditions under which these properties must uh, meet. We've also provided some clarification uh, regarding uh, whether properties that are currently residential can convert to commercial and take advantage of this, and there's some restrictive clarifying language noted in the, uh, in the letter uh, that I believe is consistent with the intent of the policy uh, approved last fall. Um, and uh, uh, also, I did want to note we did receive a, uh, the council received a memo from Councilmember Friedson uh, over the weekend or perhaps Monday uh, expressing his support. He could not be here today, but I did want to note that that made it into the addendum of the, of the packet. Uh, and he notes his support for those two requests and the commercial sewer service policy in general. Although the other thing I'd note is the, an attorney for the uh, two properties in question also had submitted some suggested language similar to what I had just mentioned earlier about its uh, consistency with Thrive 2050. Uh, that was not an explicit reason for the MDE denial, but it was in some of the discussion back and forth and included in some of the Maryland Department of Planning uh, letters to MDE and some of the background in the MDE letter. Uh, so to make clear the council's position on that, staff does suggest that we include some general language in, in the letter that notes uh, our belief that the uh, commercial sewer service policy is in alignment uh, with Thrive 2050. Uh, so staff can draft that prior to uh, uh, the final letter going out. So I did want to note that as well. And that's consistent and uh, without objection. The, uh, the one final issue I wanted to note, it's, it's unrelated to the 10-year plan, but we had another request, the uh, Mohebi request, which had been uh, deferred and then taken up by the council at the same time last fall. Um, uh, the applicant was having problems with his on-site septic system. The council was sympathetic to those issues and recommended approval uh, of the uh, of sewer to that property uh, to relieve those problems. Uh, MDE um, uh, denied that request but noted that if a uh, inspection uh, determined that there was a failure on the site that they would uh, be amenable to reconsidering. 
Uh, we had DPS go back out to the site uh, earlier this month. Uh, DPS did not identify any particular failure on the site. There are some on-site challenges, and they had some recommendations for the applicant to consider some on-site uh, modifications. Uh, but at this time, we don't have uh, uh, the grounds that M MDE asked for for us to seek reconsideration of that request. Uh, so staff did not include that request within the letter uh, that we have today. So appreciate that background. Uh, and for colleagues who are not on the t and &E committee and were not here last year, uh, this was a, a complicated case. And uh, I use the word complicated because you had a homeowner who was having problems but had a, another problem in trying to work with count, the county to try and resolve that. Uh, and it took him coming to this building twice, most recently a few weeks ago, saying that uh, the county was not sending anybody there, despite repeated requests. And that is why we approved uh, the, the property owner, the homeowner, Mr. Mohebi's request last year. It's why the committee uh, approved it just a few weeks ago. Uh, but at the time, I also stated that within a week, we needed DPS and or DEP to go on site to finally go and visit the house. Uh, and it seems that that has happened. Uh, it is, in my estimate, in estimation, um, it's unfortunate that it took that long uh, to get to where we are. Uh, and, uh, and Mr. Levchenko, just to reiterate what you're stating, because DPS has gone to the property and has assessed that there are other remedies, uh, there are not grounds for us to appeal. Is that correct? Yeah, the, uh, the MDE letter was very specific that it needed to see that there was a documented failure uh, of the system. Uh, DPS did inspect the system. Like I said, they identified some, some issues, uh, but had some on-site uh, remedies that they thought would help with the long-term maintenance and uh, issue of, of uh, some of the uh, replacement of parts that the applicant had, had had to deal with over the last five years, uh, but but not a failure in the traditional sense that uh, uh, DEP and the council have dealt with uh, frequently in the past in terms of approvals that have gone to the state. Okay. And that's all I have, unless there's questions for the council members. Uh, once again, the, the, the um, uh, request today is for the council to express its, its uh, support for a letter to go out. A draft letter is in the packet, but we will make some revisions to it, as I noted earlier, regarding some of the Thrive language. Uh, and then uh, that would go out into the council president's signature to MDE uh, shortly, within the next uh, week or so. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you for that thorough uh, explanation and report out Mr. Lovchenko. I appreciate DPS uh, being here as well. So colleagues, there is a T&E recommendation for this uh, uh, letter of reconsideration. All those in favor of the letter, and that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and colleagues, with that, we're adjourned. Oxford Road, Maryland 121, to the truck skills. Travel is slow on I-495 in the following locations. Interlude from Old Georgetown Road, Maryland.